here and there will be more coming in, but we've got to get moving because we have a time frame and we want to give our presenters the majority of it. Uh, I'm really glad you, of course, as you see, and I am actually going to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence James in a few minutes, and we're so happy that he's here to be with us, and also uh, Miss Jane Elliott. I'm extending a warm welcome to each of you in behalf of Thornton Township Supervisor Frank M. Zuccarelli, the Human Relations Commission, our Youth and Family Services, the Faith, Dignity, and Respect Initiative, and of course, the hospitality of our host, South Suburban College, the faculty, and the students. We have two powerful presenters who, we, who will explore and, spend, and speak to you regarding the very world of diversity and racism. To expedite in the use of our time, please read some of the information from your program and get additional info from the internet. It is at this time that I want to give extra special thanks and gratitude to my co-chairperson who is sitting out front, uh, Ms. Mabel Bricker, Dr. Jerry Weems, and the entire Human Relations Commission team. Now for a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, turn off your cell phones. Okay, let's sit back, relax, look, listen, and let's learn what these two people have to be present to us, this dynamic duo. So let's get it on. At this time, I want to present to you Dr. Lawrence James, Jr. Thank you. I like to move around, so I can't be stuck here at this podium, which means I have these notes, and Lord knows about two seconds from now I'm going to move, and I'm going to miss them all. So I apologize already if I get off script. But first, let me thank the committee for this opportunity to come and speak to you all today. Um, it won't sound like it, because I never do super excited really well, but I really am super excited to be here. I'd like to thank um, Mr. Zuccarelli for this opportunity, Dr. Weems, um, and the organizing committee. I thought I'd come here and be the most provocative person um, standing on the stage, um, and then I met Jane and realized that wasn't going to happen. Um, so I will try, if I can't be provocative, to be informed. A presentation says, Conscious and Unconscious Bias Awake, Dr. Lawrence James, Jr., PhD. That's a whole mouthful. Uh, a bit foreboding, even, for me. Um, but there's this really uh, famous speech that I like to recount every time I give a speech. It's by the Hall of Famer. His name is Aeneas Williams. People often ask me, oh, he must be your favorite football player. No. I think I saw him play three times in his whole career, but one day I happened to be watching the Hall of Fame, and he said this, um, and you should all remember it. He said at his speech, he said, why, are you, why, why did you make the Hall of Fame? He said, well, I was a pretty good player. He goes, but I thought of the end, and I was going to die trying. I don't do it justice, but I will die trying to make this not only interesting and entertaining, but informed. Start with the end in mind. What do I want you to walk away from this conversation? It's really one 
two simple things. One, this whole conversation about unconscious bias, frankly, is bullshit. And it's a waste of time. And so all of you came for me to tell you everything that there is to know about unconscious bias. Sorry, it ain't going to happen. I'm not going to do it. Because um, I don't actually believe it. Two, unconscious bias is actually not unconscious. It isn't unconscious. It's automatic. I'll give you the example of why I say that. How many of you drove here today? Almost everybody. How many of you make this journey on a regular basis? Quite a few. A lot of the students. If you make this journey on a regular basis, how many of you actually remember the drive over here? One person. You remember because why? You drive it every day. Did anything special happen to make you remember today? No. It actually is automatic. You're not conscious of how you got here. You probably were like listening to the radio and all of a sudden you were here. What's automatic about driving, what's automatic about bias, is it happens over and over and over and over and over again. So much so that we call it unconscious because you're not really aware that it's happening. But it's happening. As a psychologist, I go back and I study all these things. And one of the things that you learn very quickly in this space is this notion of unconscious, what I call automatic bias, happens in infancy. Very small children, like three months old, actually will do facial recognition um, by the time they're two or three months old. Why? It's actually exposure, right? If you are a black child and you're always exposed to black faces, you're going to have a preference for black faces because you see them all the time. If you are white, same happens. Unless you live in an environment that's actually relatively neutral, so that you're seeing a lot of different faces, or maybe if your parents are biracial. So this process is very automatic. You don't think about it. But it happens and it happens and it happens. And so let's dispel this notion that this is unconscious. I know there's a beautiful test and somebody's going to have you do the Harvard test for unconscious bias. Stop wasting your time. Don't do it. It's not going to tell you anything that you need to know. What you need to know is this happens automatically. And if we make the unconscious conscious, what we're doing is creating You stop the process. And what we want to do, and I think what Jane will talk to you about, is stopping the process that makes it automatic. Because in creating awareness of that process, then you start to understand, how can I make change? I was talking to Dr. Weems' wife earlier today, and we were talking about, I do work in the corporate setting, and it's like, why haven't diversity and inclusion measures really worked? Um, and frankly, this is why I don't do unconscious bias training, and why I tell you it doesn't work, uh, for the same reason. If it was really easy and simple, right, and it was just about awareness, I'd be like, I'm talking to you guys right now, I'm like, hey, be aware that um, you're biased and you're kind of racist. And then you just change. If it was that simple, you just go, oh, okay, I'm kind of racist, I'm kind of biased, let me go do something different. It don't work that way. Y'all all know that, I know that. There's more too. So when we do unconscious bias training, when we talk about this awareness piece, it's one step. And that's typically where corporations stop. They'll tell you, hey, we did some training, we made all of our people aware that they are kind of biased, kind of racist. And then we expect that to be enough and that they're going to do something really different. Awareness training without skill building and without behavioral intervention to continue to grow one's capabilities to be less racist and less biased is the only way that you can create change, period. Anybody who tells you anything else is lying. Because it won't work, because we see it every day. It's one of the reasons why we have the person in, our, in the presidency right now doing the things that he does. And this is, I'm not here to make a political statement about the president. What I am here to say is the bias that he has unleashed in many people, one, automatically, was already there. 
The only thing that he has done is made it okay for people to speak out loud about what they were already thinking and feeling inside. So, this ain't no change. And for you young folks, I'm 54, for you guys it feels like, oh my god, this is horrible. It sucks. It sucks real bad. Um, but it ain't new. It ain't new. I was born in 1964, and frankly, by 1968, this feels like that. It's just a revert. So, we're going to continue to come back to this place unless we are consciously making change. So I want to challenge each of you to be champions for change. And that champion for change is not, so I'm talking, can, can, can I talk about black people for a second? And my other brown people in this room, and I'm gonna talk to my gay and lesbian folks as well. Look, this ain't just them white folks' problem. We want to make it that way, because it feels kind of easy to us, because we're like, you know, if we're safe and we ain't doing certain things, it's all of our problems. We all have to change, and we have to be willing to acknowledge everyone's diversity. So when I have these conversations, I like telling stories. And my first challenge to all of you, and we don't have time to do it today, but if we did, I, my first thing that I would do is I'd pair you guys up next day, like, tell somebody your story. What is your diversity story? Because everybody has one. My obvious one is I happen to be black. I'm sure I could make a diversity story about being a man, and I probably could make one about being straight. But I have a diversity story. Everybody in this room has a diversity story. And we have to be willing to honor everyone's story if we hope to create change. And frankly, me calling you a racist because you happen to be white ain't gonna make that change, okay? We have to be partners in an effort to make things different. And so my challenge to all of you is take some time to understand everybody else's diversity story because you might find that they have something in common with you. Next step after I make that diversity story that everybody gets to participate in is we need to build some skills. Part of that skill is challenging ourselves to get others to tell us their stories. A part of that is an awareness of things that are important. So for me, mission is always important. And I would challenge you in this space, what is your mission? What are we trying to accomplish by talking about diversity and inclusion? Because if you ain't got no goal, if you don't have an end in the mind, Aeneas Williams said, you never accomplish anything. So what's your goal? My goal when I do these presentations is to create awareness and get folks to think and get them to change. I just need you to do one thing. I don't need you to do ten. Hell, I don't need you to do five. Just one. Because one can make a difference. And so what's the one thing that you're going to do different to make this a better place for all of us? Now, my one thing starts with standing up here, and as, as Dr. J likes to say, chopping it up. I'm going to talk crazy for a while, and I'm going to sit down. That's my one thing. The second thing that I do is I build programs designed to create change in this space. So that's what I do. And I try to teach people, what are the skills and capabilities that you need to bring to the table to actually create and craft change? But I need all of y'all to do that and to help. Because honestly, I stand up here as the expert, but I honestly don't know all the answers. I wish I did, because um, then I'd be really rich. Um, but I think change comes because we, and I stress that word, we are in it together. We are trying to create change. And we use the best of all of our capabilities to do that. The best work that I've ever seen in the space of teams working together looks like this. It's a bunch of really diverse people, all in a room, who bring their full, authentic selves to the table. So, 
My full authentic self happens to be some of those things that I mentioned to you. I'm white chocolate. I'm L chocolate. I'm a son, I'm an uncle, friend, scholar of a sort. And wherever I go, I am conscious of bringing all of Lawrence James to the table. And by the way, Lawrence James is actually different. I look at this and I laugh, actually. Uh, do you know why Dr. Lawrence James is up there? Anybody got a guess? Did somebody say more money? <laughs> God, I wish it was that easy. Um, any other guess besides more money? I'm like, no. I didn't take you with me. You like more money. Yes, sir, way back. back. Build trust. Trust and credibility. If I just came up there and they said, unconscious, unconscious bias, awakening, Lawrence James, I'd be like, who the hell is he? And why the hell am I going to listen to him? But I put doctor in front of my name, and all, all of a sudden it's like, woo, this dude must know something. You can decide that by the end of this. Um, but Dr. James has credibility. Lawrence James, not so much. He's just a dude. Up here, talking, crazy. Right? Do you know why I have a suit on? Brother got to look the part. Right? Now, and this is where biases do play a role. I can't roll up here, even as Dr. James, in some sweatpants and a hoodie, and have y'all think I'm crazy. You know, I'd be like, why is this thug up here trying to talk? Right? I also like clothes, so I like my suit, so, you know, I thought, I was trying to get that from a little clock square and all that. Um, but this is all a part of an image and a facade for you all to believe I'm credible. For you all to listen to this to craziness that I'm getting ready to bring. It's a costume. But that costume is not authentic to who Lawrence James is. Because the real Lawrence James costs Way too much. Way too much. My mother's always on my case about it. He's pretty irreverent. Talks a whole bunch of stuff. Well, I guess he did show up today, didn't he? Um, and he don't give a damn what y'all think. I don't care. That is my freedom. And it is the thing when I go to my clients as a consultant and I say the most outlandish things in the room and they go, damn, hmm, I might have to listen to him because he don't really care. Including, like, I don't care if you fire him. I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. So that is the real James. And I want all of y'all, in whatever way you're comfortable, to bring that to the table because it becomes the mechanism for us to create change. Black folks, we just too cramped up trying to be what we think white folks want us to be. And, and it is actually killing black America. And I mean literally killing black America hypertension, stroke, heart attack. All these things are physical manifestations of stress that our community constantly feels. Right? And white folks, yours is the illusion or delusion that you are superior. Because it's killing you too. Because you're not. You're just people. But your pedestal, Jane will talk about this, but your pedestal gives you an air of superiority that you have not earned, you do not deserve, and frankly, you ain't that good at caring. And you won't die if you're not dying. You're gonna be all right. Hear me again, you're gonna be all right. 
and maybe the world would be better because you're not. American superiority is killing people all over the world. We are, and rightfully so, crying about a man who got killed in an embassy in Turkey. We are separating children at the border from their parents. Because we are afraid some brown people will come over the border and take over America. Guess what? We already out for you. And guess what? We ain't running around trying to kill all y'all for no good reason. So, your fear is unfounded. It's unfounded. So challenge yourself to think and act different. Be aware. What are the biases that I bring to the table? And how do I need to challenge myself to be different, to be better, to be greater? So it's behavior, it's skill, and most important, it is action. I can make you aware, you can build some skills, but if you don't ever do a damn thing with it, it ain't gonna help nobody. It ain't gonna help nobody. So you've got to act in addition to being better, being more capable. Actions can be really, really simple. I am personally right now working on my 90-day plan for my mission. My mission is to change the world. No bullshit. No bullshit. That is my mission. Jay told me I had to stop apologizing for that mission, and he was right. He'd been telling me for years, like, Lawrence, don't apologize for that. But I did. And I still do. And my challenge to myself is to not apologize. Because as Dr. King said, I may not get there. But I'm a doctor. My goal is to change the world. My goal is to make you aware. And my goal is to be through, to make that journey through each of you. We can create change. But we must be in this together, partnering together to understand what is going to create change. And that is not simply us talking about this stuff. Be conscious and be conscientious. I am not a religious man. But I'll tell you a simple way for this world to be better. I love studying religion. I probably read anything from African animus religion to Buddhism to you name it. Every, and I mean every, religious tradition has basically the same tenets. Everyone, including the folks who are doing stuff like Sanskrit. They actually all believe the same thing. Believe in a power higher than yourself, be nice to other folks, and treat them well. It's really that simple. Now, we are fighting and killing each other over religion, even though the essence of what we believe is exactly the same. So, we use words, we use knowledge, we use technology as weapons against each other. Put down your weapon. See the humanity of everyone who is in this room and next to you. I want to see you, sir. I want to know who you are. You're like golf. Yes, you, sir. You, sir, looking at me blankly. Yes, you. Oh, with that. That's a beautiful tie. Do you like golf? Golf. We should go play. Oh yeah. See, I got a new golf buddy. We have something in common. You might not think we would have something in common, but we, we like golf. Right? So, let's seek the commonality that we have. If we can do that, then we start to break down barriers. Because really, it's the barriers that are getting in the way. And it is the authenticity. I'm going to leave you with this. Everything I've said today, you can go, like, that's the S and E crazy. Please take this away. Everywhere you go, every day you live through, bring all of you to the table. 
let people see you in all of your glory. In every way, shape, and form. And don't stifle who you are because you want to conform. If I was really super mad, I'd rip off my clothes right now and you'd see my sweatsuit. Just not gonna happen. Let people see you. They will show you themselves. There is no fear in letting people see you. There's freedom. Freedom will make this a better place. And will allow other people to connect to you and your family. And they can't take that away from you. And don't let them. Peace. So, we had Dr. Lawrence James Jr. up here, and we had Lawrence James Jr. up here. Can we give both of them a hand? So, if I can kind of sum up what Dr. James had to say, there were two main points, I think, right? One had to do with authenticity, being authentic, right? And then the second one is really challenging all of us to be agents of change. <coughs> I really like that because I was going to you know, go with that agent of change one too. So I appreciate you uh, preempting me on that, Dr. James. Uh, but in addition to being an agent of change, I think it's important for us to consider the implications of being agents of love. Just, just think about that for a minute. And again, I'm not going to bore you. I'm not going to talk to Max or Wayne because the committee told me, Doc, you got to stay on schedule. So what I am going to do, I'd like to read over a few quotes. All right? And after each quote, I want it just to sit and marinate for a bit. I just want you to think about each one of these quotes. And then we'll move on to uh, introducing our second day speaker. So the first quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. People are trapped in history, and history is trapped in them. American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. Love takes off masks that we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. It is certain, in any case, that ignorance, allied with power, is the most ferocious enemy justice can have. <coughs> Love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is a growing up. To be a Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all the time. The most dangerous creation of any society is the man who has nothing to lose. Did you just talk about having nothing to lose? Children have never been very good at listening to their elders. <laughs> Don't I know it. But they have never failed to imitate them. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Now, all those quotes, and I got one or two more, all those quotes were from James Paul. And uh, if you haven't read his works or seen his videos, I encourage you to do so. I don't challenge you to do so, I encourage you to do so. 
We need to be weapons of mass construction, weapons of mass love. It's not enough just to change the system. We need to change ourselves. Every single one of us. So, those are my quotes, and that helped me keep, stay on schedule. You know, I had to go off script. Uh, committee, thank you for that. Now I'd like to bring up our guest speaker. And I'll tell you, she is not just an educator, um, you know, on her Bible. Like, literally, she is an educator. When we started conversations, Cousin Jane, when we started conversations, she immediately gave me homework to do. She assigned me a couple of books to read and a couple of articles to read, and I, I did. I did. Though I'm still working on a Sussman book. I'm still finishing it. Um, so that being said, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker. Jane Elliott is an American, former third grade school teacher, anti-racism activist. Listen, when we leave here today, all of us should be anti-racism activists, if there is such a thing. And I'm sure Cousin Jane will tell us about that. And educator. She is known for her blue eyes, brown eyes exercise. She first conducted her famous exercise for her class the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. When her local newspapers published compositions that the children had written about the experience, the reactions formed the basis for her career as a public speaker against discrimination. After leaving her school, Elliot became a diversity educator full time. She still holds the exercise and gives lectures about its effects all over the U.S. and in several locations overseas. This is one of those lit locations that she has provided her exercise. And you know, she, she gave me another instruction too before when I first met her out here. She said there's a difference between exercise and experiment. A lot of people would like to minimize and capture the work that she's done as an experiment. But that has all types of implications. What this is and has been is an exercise. So I thank you all for joining us for this iteration of her exercise. So give yourselves a hand and get ready for Cousin Jim. before the speaker speaks. Because you're, in a few minutes you're going to wish you could take that back and you can't once it's out there and you're stuck with it. And if you're going to say boo and you're going to do all those ugly things, save it until you get out of the room. I don't have time for it. Now, this gentleman before me talked about action and change. All right, I'm going to create change in this room. I want these front rows filled up. I want you folks to make some action here. And move over here so that I don't have to talk to this whole room. I can talk to this group. And I'm going to wait to speak until these rows are filled up. I'm going to wait to speak until these rows are filled up. Smart people are going to be in the front row. So what does that tell you about the people who are in the back row? You have to automatically decide that they're dumb. And, or they just are too lazy to move. There are still seats in the front rows, folks. You folks in the balcony, I'd like to appreciate very much if you would move down here so that I can speak to this group of people. Isn't it wonderful how cooperative you all are? Oh yeah, now you're thinking, yeah, she's a white bitch, I don't have to listen to her. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know what you're thinking, yeah, well, people. Bitch is the word that's most often used to refer to me. It used to bother me a lot, it doesn't anymore. For me, bitch is an acronym for being in total control, honey. <laughs> and don't you forget it, bitch. <laughs> now, how many of you women have been called the B word, meaning bitch? <laughs> okay. Boys, look, keep your hands up, women, if you've been called the B word. Now, boys, look around. Come up with a new name, we've all heard it. Be creative. Come up with something else, and it better not be the C word, you got it? <laughs> now, folks, 
you talk about change and you talk about action, but some of you do not want to move. You're acting white. <laughs> and white folks only move if black folks move in next door. <laughs> and all of a sudden, now some of these white folks are thinking, she's separating us instead of bringing us together. She shouldn't talk about black and white. Well, I'm going to show you how that works. Well, every person in this room who has a pencil and paper, take out the pencil and paper, and if you don't have one, borrow one from somebody else. Who's running this show? Get us papers and pencils from these people. <laughs> Quickly. Here are some reserve signs. Pass these reserve signs back and they can write out those. Everybody needs a paper and pencil. Even you, sir, need a paper and pencil. Get out a paper and pencil. I'm not messing around here. I'm only going to be with you for about an hour and a half. You don't have to suffer that, that long, so get busy. Because this is a test. And you are going to write down the answers to this test. So number your paper from 1 to 9 right now. Everybody, number your paper from 1 to 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Go down, not across. And then write the answers to these questions on that paper. Number 1. Does anybody else need a... Is there anybody who doesn't have a piece of paper in here? Give that woman a piece of paper, please. Well, she's a white woman. She comes without being prepared. That's the way they are. <laughs> you know how they are. Don't you know how they are? <laughs> Keep laughing. You do the same thing. Now, number one, write the answer to this question. How many races are there on the face of the earth? Put down the number that tells us how many races there are on the face of the earth. Number two, racism is A, genetic, or B, a learned response. Racism, you aren't writing, you aren't writing these answers. I'll wait until you get a paper and pencil. And you're slowing this thing down, folks. If you don't learn as much as you should, it's because these folks don't want to answer the questions. This is an important thing for you to do. Get a paper and pencil. Give him a piece of that paper and pass it back to him. Somebody give him a pencil. Then we hope he has lead in his pencil. Take that however you want to. How does everybody, there's a young woman there who needs a piece of paper and pencil. She said, I don't want to do what this honky bitch wants me to, but do it anyway. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard those words before? How many of you have ever said those words before? How many of you are thinking those words right now? How many of you think I give a damn? <laughs> now some of you are thinking, oh, this is, this is awful, I don't want to be here. Well, then, you know, there's the door. I'd rather you stay, but it's up to you. Now, do you have, give that young woman a piece of paper and a pencil. Now, are you going to write these? They number that from one to nine. I'll wait. Have you got it numbered? Check and see if she has it numbered. <laughs> see, sometimes brown-eyed people don't do what you tell them to, and then you have to make them do it over and over and over again. All right, now, number one, how many races are there on the face of the earth? Write down the number that you believe in, and turn off your telephone. Number two, racism is A, genetic, or B, a learned response. Number three, what do we call those whose parents are of different color groups? A, biracial, B, bicolor. C, none of the above. Number four, you believe in the golden rule? You believe in A, the golden rule, B, the platinum rule, either A or B. Number five, the problem which encourages racism is A, Stupidity, B, ignorance. A, stupidity, B, ignorance. Number six, racism has been around, A, forever, B, 500 years. Number seven, the cure for racism is A, education, B, indoctrination. Number eight, and there should be put A, B, C on here. I have read A, The Myth of Race. If you've read it, put a check. B, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. If you've read it, put a check. C, They Came Before Columbus. Put a check. Number nine. What is the... Read that again, please. Sure, I'll repeat it over and over and over again. Which one did you want? A, A, The Myth of Race. B, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. C, They Came Before Columbus. You're shaking your head. You're shaking your head on all three? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You talk fast. My ears hear 
I know it. I'm, I have hearing aids. I understand what you're saying. And I've got to ask you to slowly read it one more time. Okay, not a problem. I like to sort of speak, spend my time reading instead of speaking. It doesn't take as much intelligence. Okay. <laughs> Did you? A. The Myth of Race by Robert Wald Sussman. Have you read it? Don't put a check. B. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. And Anthony Browder, have you read it? No. The Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. If you've read it, you wouldn't forget it. C. They Came Before Columbus by Ivan Van Sustens. Ivan Van Servan. Ivan Van Servan. If you've read it, put a check. Number nine, what is the opposite of gay? What is the opposite of gay? All right. Now we're going to check. What's your answer? What's your question? What? <laughs> Number six, five, six, seven, six. Okay. I told you I'm wearing hearing aids. Don't be, don't blame me because I can't hear. Number six. Racism has been around a forever. B. Five hundred years. Got it? Now, we're going to check those answers after I get done speaking. And if you haven't changed your mind about those answers when I get done speaking, either you didn't learn or I failed to teach you. Now, make no mistake about this. The, learning, the listening skills are good listeners have quiet hands, feet, and mouths. So if you're writing while I'm talking, you're going to be in big trouble and I'm going to attack you for it. Because I am a bitch and I expect you to pay attention. You got it? Good listeners keep their eyes on the person who is speaking. Dr. James Doherty of Drake University said, where your eyes go is where your mind is going. So if you're a teacher in a classroom and your kids are looking all around the place, they aren't hearing what you're saying, so either shut up or take, teach them listening skills and expect them to practice them. Number, yeah, that's you damn right, that's right. I know what I'm talking about here. <laughs> Number three. Number three, good listeners, listen from the beginning to the very end. How many of you have been in a classroom where some young girl, usually young, some young white girl, has her hand up waving all the time and because she's thinking of what she wants to say, yeah, instead of what you're saying. You need to say, put your hand down or I'll cut your arm off. <laughs> no, you don't say that. You say, be careful, I will give you into the care uh, shut up, Jane. Number, <laughs> number, number four. Good listeners decide to learn something. Now, if you decide to learn something in here today, you'll learn something. If you decide not to, if you say to yourself, she's nothing but a, another white woman, she doesn't know what she's talking about, and let me tell you something. I am fully aware that every black person in this room has forgotten more cover your mouth. You aren't black, are you? You don't know any better than to sneeze into the air. <laughs> Every black person in this room has forgotten more since breakfast than I will ever learn about racism. I talk about it. You live it. You know it, and I know it. And the only reason I got away was doing the blue eye brown eye exercise in my classroom in Riceville, Iowa, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, is because I'm a white woman. And the only reason people ask me to come and talk to them is because I'm a white woman. If a black man says the things that I say, he is not going to get hired, no matter how many suits he has. <laughs> Am I right about that? Oh, okay. Now, another thing, he's talking about wearing a sweatsuit. This is a sweatshirt, people. <laughs> and it is totally unsuitable. <laughs> and once again, I don't care. I have a four C's wardrobe. Clean, comfortable, convenient, and I can't remember the other one, so it's only a three C. I'm sorry, I only know three words begin with C and they all fit this sweatshirt, you got it? And what's important about this sweatshirt is what it says on it. Y'all, let's all read my sweatshirt. Ready? Prejudice is an emotional commitment to ignorance. And that's what it is, people. Prejudiced people aren't stupid. You can't fix stupid. And if you don't believe that, look at number 44 and a half. <laughs> <laughs> C, 
Somebody needs to change him. Change his location. Into a boat out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Getting right along. But I'm not, hey, I'm not a Republican. Besides which, I don't mean that they mispronounce that word. In view of the way he behaves, it should be the Republican Party. <laughs> you'll, you'll get it in a minute. And I'm, and I'm not a Democrat because we do not believe in democracy, people. We do not believe in government of the people, by the people, for the people. We believe and we teach government of the white folk, by the white folks, and for the white folks. Make no mistake about this, I'm not as ignorant as I ought to be at this age. I'm getting worse, that's okay, don't worry about it. Now, I live in the U.S. That doesn't mean I just live in America. The U.S. spells us. And that means all of us. And all of us are being told that we are going to build a wall on the southern border of the United States so we can keep those people out of here who aren't Americans. I want you to think about that. Every person who lives from the very northern tip of Canada to the very southern tip of South America lives in one of the Americas. North America, Central America, South America. Those kids from Mexico, which he calls a shithole country, are Americans. And if he starts another war, which he probably will do to take your minds off the fact that he did collude with the Russians to get elected, he will start a war so he'll take your minds off that. And you'll think of that instead of what he's doing. And all of a sudden, black males will be very, very valuable. And we will induct them into the military in giant numbers. And we'll take them out of prison and put them in the military. And then, as during the Second World War, the officers will use them for target practice. And I know of white soldiers who came back from the Second World War and said that is exactly what happened during the Second World War in the European theory of war. I wasn't born yesterday, people. You knew that. Unless you think it was a really long day. <laughs> I've been alive a long time. And unfortunately, I've been aware a long time. And the kids we're raising today aren't going to be aware because we're raising them on a screen. Every place you look, there are kids looking either at a television screen or a cell phone in front of them with their little faces like this. It's making me a little bit cross because you need to realize that that's bad for your eyes. If you have children, get them off those cell phones and hand them a book and tell them to hold it out away from their eyes. And if they're going to do this, then they should look up at a mountain every once in a while so that they exercise their eyes. We're raising a generation of children who are know-nothings. You must tell your children and your grandchildren and your nieces and nephews, get a book. Do not let me see you without a book in your hand. And I don't mean a Kindle. I mean a book with pages in it that you have to turn. How many of you think that makes good sense? People, whether or not you think it does, it does. Just raise your hand just because I want you to. Now, you're in here because hopefully you came here to learn something. If you didn't come here to learn something, you need to be someplace else. If you don't want to learn what I'm saying, you don't have to, but it would be to your advantage to listen, and it would be to your advantage to give up this myth of white privilege. Now I know I kicked the crucifix there. People, we have several people running around the world today talking about white, white privilege. How many of you have heard white privilege stuff? Oh yeah. Conscious and unconscious bias came out of using Peggy McIntosh's list of white privileges. Now, before I do this, I want to do something else. Well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the black race, please stand. The black race. Every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the black race, please stand. Stand up. You can raise your hand. I'll take that. I'll, you can raise your hand. That's all right. Now, remain standing and remain with your hand up. Well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the white race, please stand. 
Will every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the brown race please stand? And the brown race includes all those people from South and Central America and all those First Nations people that we call Indians because we don't know any better. Now will all those people who consider themselves a member of the yellow race please stand? Now, if you look around, you'll see that most everybody is either standing or has their hand raised. That's because you all think you're members of different races. Now, will every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the human race please sit down? Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, people, there is only one race of people on the face of the earth. It, that up. That's a fact. Not while I'm talking, you're slowing me down. And at my age, I can't afford to be slowed down. You got it? You, you keep him in one line, will you please? You're his wife, right? Oh, that, oh, you're, he's okay. Don't keep him in line. Probably nobody can. Now, getting right along, people, you need to know that the first modern human beings that evolved on this earth were black women. And they evolved in sub-Saharan Africa from 300,000 to 500,000 years ago. Black women. Now, for many years, there were nothing but black women because they reproduced asexually. <laughs> now, as a result of a mutation of the genes, the first male was born. So women, when you're arguing with a man, remember you're talking to a mutant and don't get upset. <laughs> Now you're thinking, she doesn't like men. Well, yes, I do. Oh, God, do I ever. <laughs> and I appreciate men, and I'd like to see them stay alive. But they won't. Most of you women will spend the last 10 to 20 years of your lives without male companionship. I resent that. I resent that a lot. I used to laugh when I said that. I don't laugh anymore. My husband died five years ago. And my oldest son died four months ago. And what I am going through, practically every black woman in this room has gone through with a child, a black male, who's a lot younger than 61. And I resent it. And I'm angry. And I want it stopped. Because since we all have the same great 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 great, great grandmother back there, about 300,000 to 500,000 years ago, every person in this room is a 30th, 50th, to 50th cousin of mine. And every one of you is a 30th to 50th cousin of all those people in this room. We are all cousins because we all have the same ancestors. You got it? Amen. Then turn to the person either on your right or your left, in front of you or behind you, stick out your hand, smile and say, hello, cousin. <laughs> some of my more ignorant white cousins abuse some of my cousins of other color groups, not because of the color of your skin, but because of the ignorance of us white folks. Anytime somebody says to you, he doesn't like you because of the color of their skin, you need to say, no, 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 that's the reason he doesn't like me. The first modern human beings on earth look like me. So it's not because of my skin color, it's because of his ignorance about skin color. Skin color is natural. And in fact, white folks, you need to know that what you really are is faded black. <laughs> I swear to you and I swear at you, but you need to know that if you trace your DNA back far enough, you nice white blonde folks, you'll find out that some of your DNA came from a country in Africa. So when we're talking about the human race, we should really be talking about which race? Black. Oh, oh the pain, the pain from Cousin Jane. Yeah, Cousin Jane will bring you pain. And I will bring you a statement that says, do not believe in the myth of white privilege. This is the list that Peggy McIntosh, bless her heart, came up with in about 1987. 
Listen to some of the things she said on this. I am not made acutely aware that my shape, bearing, or body order will be taken as a reflection on my race. I am sure that my children will be given curricular materials that testify to the existence of their race. I can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that I will not be followed or harassed because of my race. I, I can arrange to be in the company of people of my race most of the time. Now folks, since we're all in the same race, which is which one? Since we're all members of the same race, these things should be true about all of us, shouldn't they? We should all have these privileges if it is truly on race. She isn't talking about race. She is talking about skin color. And if she would put skin color in this list instead of race, then you could all laugh it off. Because you can't change your skin color and you shouldn't have to. I want to show you something. Well, there aren't enough of them in here. We won't do that. People, you need to realize that we base, we assign power in the United States of America on the basis of physical characteristics over which we have absolutely no control. We assign power on the basis of height, skin color, gender, and age. That is ridiculous. I know 10-year-old black girls who know more about race and have forgotten more than I will ever learn. But they don't have the power to dare to stand up and say to a teacher who is making racist statements, you shouldn't say that because Jane Elliott is going to get you. Now, how many of you have had a teacher stand up in front of you, K through 12, K through 22, and say, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. How many of you have had that experience? Oh, yeah. oh my God. How many of you have had this one? When I see people, I don't see people as black or brown or red or yellow. I just see people as people. How many of you have had that one? Yeah. How many of you have ever had that with the word white in it? Usually they leave out the word white. How about this one? I don't care whether you're black, brown, red, yellow, or green with purple polka dots. I'm going to treat y'all alike. How many of you have ever heard that one? How many of you have ever seen earthlings who are green with purple polka dots? <laughs> Even when you've had too much to drink and you're throwing up in the sink, you still aren't green with purple polka dots. But when a teacher lumps all those people of color in with those who are green with purple polka dots, what she is saying, sending is the message that you're all from outer space. And the next thing she's going to say, either out loud or in the way she behaves, if you don't like it here, why don't you go huh? back where you belong or back where you came from. At which point you need to say, I am where I came from, fool. And so are you. You came from me. Get over it. <laughs> when a woman says to me, and it happens to me all the time, some women constantly, women constantly say to me, I'm colorblind, I don't see color. <laughs> I say, I knew you were colorblind before you told me. If you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't wear that blouse with those pants. <laughs> <laughs> but when some white woman says to you, I'm colorblind, yeah, I don't see color, what are you supposed to say? You're supposed to say, thank you, I appreciate that. Because what she's telling you is, I'm willing to ignore the discoloration of your skin. Wow. That's called not unconscious bias. That's called racism. Ignorant racism. Don't be so ignorant that you take it for a, as a compliment. It is not a compliment. I was standing beside tall, aggressive, not just assertive, aggressive, Linda Gillery, black Linda Gillery, several years ago in, a down, in, in a downtown Denver, Colorado in a major rest, in a major hotel. And this white woman, skinny little white woman, now number one, I took exception to her because she was thin. I hate thin people. Because <laughs> I can't be one. And she was a teeny tiny little person. And she had heels this tall that made her almost, almost normal. And she diddled. Now I know you have a different meaning for diddle. My daughter says, don't say diddle. Well, she had with this nasty meaning to diddle. Diddle means take short, fast steps. Goodness, because she had to keep up with her heels. She, she couldn't do it. She almost fell on her face, and I wanted to see that. She came up to Linda Gillery and said, Linda, when I see you, I don't see you black. And I thought, oh my God, she's going to kill her. I've got to back up. I, I don't want to get this. I've got to wear this suit tomorrow. I can't take the bloodshed. So I stepped back, and Linda Gillery said, I think you have an eye problem. Let's make an appointment with the optometrist so that we can get your eyes fixed. 
Now, instead of saying thank you, that woman did it away just as fast as she could. Because she, Linda, hadn't said thank you for because this woman didn't see Linda black. Now, on every person on the face of the earth, what is the largest inch by inch piece of your body? Your skin, people. Anybody who says to anybody, I see you, I don't see you black, needs to have at least one of their eyes punched out. No, they shouldn't have one of their eyes punched out. What they should have is there some other some other adjustment. Because we need to put a stop to this nonsense. We need to put a stop to saying unconscious bias, unconscious bias. How many of you can tell when somebody is treating you in a racist way? How many of you recognize it immediately? How many of you think implicit bias and explicit bias is a way to justify what we white people do all the time and to control our thinking? That's oh, not a man, a women. <laughs> We've got, to, we've got to be careful, people, because everything in our society is biased in favor of men, particularly white ones. Our history is, we don't have a history, we have hysteria. In this country, what we call education is actually indoctrination. It takes us from the age of five to the age of 18 to thoroughly indoctrinate people to the myth of white superiority. And that is what we do in schools every day, all day long. How many of you would agree with that? How many of you are teachers? How many of you don't agree with that? Well, thank you, you, you don't agree with that. You, but you didn't say you did agree with it either. Are we in the business of indoctrinating people? I'm talking those two teachers right back there. Those two lovely white teachers. <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. When you were in school, did you learn that Columbus discovered America? Yes. How, what were the names of Columbus's three ships, folks? <laughs> Aren't you just proud of yourselves? The Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. Oh, what a bunch of shit. I'm sorry, in my next life I'm going to be a rap, rap singer. I'm taking, I'm taking lessons from T.I. Harris oh, and from Killer Mike. Oh, I have pictures of me beside Killer Mike and T.I. Harris. You can see me beside T.I. Harris, but you can't see me beside Killer Mike. He's this much taller and this much bigger and he is absolutely gorgeous and I want to take him home. <laughs> I've been a long, long time, not People. The first thing we have to do is change education from indoctrination to education. I'm an educator. How many of you know somebody who's a teacher? That's too bad. How many of you know somebody who's an educator? People, there's a big difference between being a teacher and being an educator. Teachers provide facts and figures so kids can pass the test at the end of the year. The word educator comes from the root duck, goose, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. Amen. Now you, hey women, now be careful. You can't lead people out of ignorance if you teach history that it all is all about the contributions made by white males. I asked a professor, he said, I'm a professor, I know these things. I said, you profess to know these things, don't you? Right. He said, I've got my degree. Okay, and I said, how many degrees do you have? I've got a PhD. I said, oh good, that means you had a BS. And, and MS, have you? Yes. I said, well, you see, for me, BS means bullshit. <laughs> MS means more of the same. <laughs> PhD means piled higher and deeper. <laughs> now, I admire people who have all that education. If it's education and not indoctrination. If 
they profess to lead people out of ignorance, they will do away with the myth of white superiority. But if you try, believe me, if you try to teach against the myth of white superiority in the public schools in this country, you are in deep doggy doo doo right now. I know how that feels. I have been through that for the last 50 years. I've been <laughs> 50 years, that's half a century, people. We should have learned better by now. We should have made change by now. We should have fixed this system by now. But instead, because we had eight years of a black man in the White House, we are living with the white response to that fact. Make no mistake about this, what you are seeing is a reaction to white people who are scared to yeah. death. Yeah. Now, not every single white person is scared to death, but you should be. Because within 30 years, white people will have lost their numerical majority in the United States of America. Within 30 years. Now, I want to show you something. One of the major fears that white people express to me, I haven't to say anything, is if those people get power, they're going to want to treat us the way we've treated them. Oh. How many of you have heard that one? Okay, now, well, every black person in this room, I'm talking about color group here, I'm not talking about race. Well, every black person in this room who wants to get even with all white people, raise your hand. Now, white folks, look around. <laughs> it's okay, white people, now. Well, every black person in this room who'd like to get even with one or two white people, raise your hand. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Now, folks, all you white folks have to do is act in a way that you are not one of, one of those one or two white people that they want to get even with. That's all you have to do, folks. Change the way you behave in the present so that you will be treated better in the future. White people, you've got to change the way you treat people of other color groups in the present or in the future. I'm afraid you might have to worry about it. But maybe you won't, because maybe they're more civilized than we white folks are. I can only hope, I can only hope that they are. When I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, the first day, the first time I did it, how much time do I have here? Seems like a lot longer, but how much? Does anybody know? But, 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 but. What? Somebody said I have 40 more minutes. <laughs> You could be dead in 44 minutes. <laughs> First time I did, how many of you are familiar with the blue eyed brown eyed exercise? How many of you don't know anything about it? How many of you don't know what in hell I'm talking about? I, I don't know either, but people. The day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I was teaching third grade in all white, all Christian rights still. I have eight Christian churches. They're all full on Sunday and some were full on Friday night and Saturday night. So we know about religion. We know about judge not that ye be not judged. We know about do unto others as you would have others do unto you. How many of you learned the golden rule when you were in Sunday school or someplace? Oh, yeah. How many of you practiced the golden rule? You're lying in your teeth. You know what I mean? <laughs> Number one. Do you treat people the way you want to be treated? Yeah. Not all the time, thank you very much. There's an honest fail. Stand up so we can all see what that looks like. <laughs> that takes courage, thank you very much. You may sit down. Number one, people. Was that one of the questions I gave you? Golden rule versus platinum rule? All right, now I'm going to give you the answer to that. The golden rule came out of Chinese philosophy. And in Chinese philosophy it said, do unto others as, you would, as others would have you do unto them. Treat others the way they want to be treated. And please do not take my remarks and please put that damn thing down. Thank you. <laughs> now, people, do unto others as others would have you do unto them. In order to find out how someone wants to be treated, what do you have to do? Ask them. And then what do you have to do? Listen to the answer. And then if what they ask you to do is not illegal, indecent, or immoral, you have to do it. Now, one of the major differences between, please turn that off back there with your gray sweater, thank you very much, <laughs> people. If you practice the platinum rule, 
What you have to do is learn to communicate with those who are different from yourself. But if you practice the golden rule and say, say to yourself, well, you're going to treat me the way I want to be treated, how does that other person know how you want to be treated? We white folks say, you know how I want to be treated. Uh -huh. One of the major differences between white people and members of other color groups is when white people come into a new environment, they immediately adjust the environment to fit their needs. Think about that. When people of color come into a new environment, they immediately adjust their needs to fit the environment. Which is the reason that lovely black, black speaker wears a suit. And which is the reason I can get away with wearing an old white sweatshirt. Because I'm an old white woman. And I can do whatever I want to, make no mistake about that. <laughs> First, I have to find somebody to do it with, but I can do it. <laughs> people, you need to realize that we white people came to this land and commenced to adjust the environment to fit our needs. We have adjusted it to the point where you drive, and I did this this week, you drive from Osage, Iowa to Des Moines, Iowa, and you have to keep the windows on the car rolled up because of the smell of hog manure in the air. Our former governor, Terry Braindead, well, Branstead, Terry Branstead, <laughs> told farmers that they could raise as many animals in confinement as they chose to because Iowa is a farming state. So we now have, we are now raising over 30 million hogs in Iowa. And every one of those hogs has to give you a little bit of excrement every day. And that excrement, excrement is put in puddles underneath the building, great big vats, and then they take it out and spread it on the land. And so you smell hog excrement as you go through Iowa. We went from, from Osage to Des Moines, I worked in Des Moines, we went from Des Moines to Sioux City, worked in Sioux City, we went from Sioux City back to Osage, and every place we went smelled like hog manure. Now who do you suppose owns those hogs? Have any idea? The Chinese. The Chinese are attempting to colonize the United States of America. Now, don't say she doesn't like Chinese people. Yes, I do. I just don't want them to have American farmers, United States farmers, raising 30 million hogs for the Chinese pork market. And that's what's going on. How many of you have seen what's happening in Kenya? Anybody? What's happening in Kenya? But they are trying to colonize Kenya. They are bringing in the same kind of behaviors there that they're bringing into the United States. You need to be aware of what's happening. Iowa used to be called the beautiful land. Now it's called a sacrifice zone. That's what the people in, in the people in positions of power in Iowa are calling the state of Iowa, the sacrifice zone because we're willing to sacrifice the quality of the air, the quality of the water, the quality of the ground through the raising of hogs in confinement for the Chinese, for Chinese pork consumption. How many of you think that is absolutely unacceptable? Well, people, you better realize that it is unacceptable because I live in, I live in part of Iowa where it's limestone. It's dirt over limestone. And that hog manure, that liquefied manure, goes down through that dirt, the top side is only about this deep in northeast Iowa, into that limestone, goes through the limestone, it isn't filtered, it goes through the limestone in, into the rivers, the creeks, the lakes, and the streams. Practically every body of water in Iowa right now is polluted with hog excrement and the antibiotics that they feed those hogs to keep them healthy. Now, how many of you would be upset with that if you lived next door to one of those? I lived next door to seven. I came back from Snohomish, while I was in Snohomish, Washington, while I was helping my son try to survive cancer, I feel. Opened the windows, and this horrible odor came into my house. And I thought, oh my God, that is hominum. I want to show you something. Everybody in this room, take a deep breath. Now expel it with gusto. Now breathe in again. Now when you expel, when you exhale, 
you ex are exhaling tiny, tiny pieces of your anatomy. Molecules of your heart, your liver, your lungs, your every, every part of you goes into the air. When you inhale, you are inhaled pieces of the person next to you. So now, not only are you cousins, you have just breathed in the person that's sitting beside you. Now, if I tell that to enough white people, the first thing I'm going to do is buy stock in a surgical mask company. Because I know that a whole lot of white folks, oh, are you leaving us? Fellas, you'll never know the answer to those questions now. Did I try to teach them? Yes, I did. If you see people walking down the street after this and they're wearing surgical masks, you'll know that they're trying not to breathe in what you breathe out. Wow. Somebody said to me yesterday, well, what would you do if, if you were with Donald Trump? Donald Trump? I said, I'd quit breathing. <laughs> Immediately, and he'd be happy about that, and so would I. Now, people, the day after I did the day I did the blue eye night exercise, the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I didn't know that he had been killed. We were, I was learning, we were teaching the Indian unit at that time. How many of you remember the Indian unit when you were in third grade? Yeah, you do too. Yeah, yeah. We always teach the Indian unit in the spring because by spring the kids are really tired of being in the classroom. So you have to do something that's fun and that's exciting and that has a lot of good stuff with it. So I was doing the Indian unit. It, our lesson plan for the next day was to learn the Sioux Indian prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. I, I took the teepee home that we had made the previous year. I was going to wash it, dry it, iron it, set it, and we were going to set it up in my classroom the next morning. And we were going to learn and to read Indian poetry written by white folks. We were going to read Indian stories written by white folks. We were going to sing Indian songs written by white folks. And we were going to learn the Sioux Indian prayer, Old Great Spirit, Keep Your Memory from Me, that was written by white folks and was taught to the Sioux Indians by a white missionary. And I didn't know that at that time. So I had this thing under my arm. I walked into my house. The telephone was ringing. I answered the telephone. My sister said, is your television on? I said, no. You better turn it on. Why? Because they shot him. I said, who did they shoot this time? Because we are in a shooting nation. She said, Martin Luther King Jr. And then all the amusement stopped. Martin Luther King Jr. was one of our heroes of the month in my third grade classroom. He was a hero of the month along with, unfortunately, George Washington, who owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln, who refused to free the slaves until he absolutely had to do it. Daniel Boone, who was famous because he took over Native Americans' land and used it for his own and killed those who disagreed with him. And Davy Crockett, who died killing Mexicans as we tried to take over more of their land. Those were the heroes that I taught in February. That was racist teaching. And I would have sworn that I wasn't a racist. I was absolutely appalled when she told me that. I got the kids fed, put them to bed, and then I turned on television. I watched them around the TV. I laid down the living room floor, plugged in the iron, was ironing this TV and watching what happened on television. And there sat Walter Cronkite with three leaders of the black community. And he said to those three black males, when our leader was killed, his widow held us together. Who's going to keep your people in line? I was furious. How dare he say that? But our leader, who was he talking about? JFK. According to Walter Cronkite, JFK was the leader of whom? White folks. When our leader was killed, his widow held us together. See how strong we are. See how wonderful that young white woman is. Who's going to keep your people in line? Now until that moment, I thought that your people were my people. I actually thought that we're all members of the same race. I actually thought that the Bible tells us that we're all members of the same race. The Bible talks about the family of man, when in fact it's the family of woman. But man wrote the Bible, except for a couple of verses, chapters. I was furious. I thought, how dare you say a thing like that? How can you be this ignorant? So I changed the channel. I knew I could find somebody better. So there sat Dan Rather talking to three black males, and to them he said, think you should feel sympathy for us white people because we can't feel the anger at this killing that you Negroes can. I thought, you simple son of a bitch. I'm sorry, but I did. 
How dare he say that? How many of you think that white people should have been angry at the killing of Martin Luther King Jr.? People, if they couldn't be angry because it was another human being, they should be angry because this country has a reputation for solving our problems with guns. And we don't want to give them up. And we have a president who says, you don't have to. And so we have a whole lot more, we have more guns in this country than we have people. You need to realize that. Now, I like a gun. Sometimes I wish I had one in my pocket. <laughs> my family, we, we were raised on a farm and we shot pheasants. I'll never forget the day. We lived in Waterloo, Iowa. I don't know if you know anybody from Waterloo, Iowa. Well, we lived in Waterloo, Iowa. And Daryl Brandon's um, supermarket in the North End, which is the black section of town for the National Tea Company. And he said to some of his black customers, if you want to hunt pheasants, go out to my wife's family's farm in Northeast, and you know, in, out by Riceville, and they'll let you hunt pheasants there. So when pheasant, doesn't see, pheasant doesn't, hunting season started, my dad was outside, and here came these big black men, I mean big black men, and each of them had a shotgun, like this. And here he is, Ted, picture this. He's out in the yard, this little man, surrounded by all these big black guys, and he said, you guys shoot goon? <laughs> and they all looked at each other and started to chuckle. One of them said, yeah, Mr. Jensen, we do some, you know, hunt goon? He said, young hunt goon? Yeah, Mr. Jensen, and he lift up his gun. He says, sometimes we even shoot a few. And my dad almost, almost melted with embarrassment. He said, well, what I mean is, do you shoot raccoons? And they said, we know what you meant, Mr. Jensen. We know what you're talking about. They were tender and gentle and tolerant of his ignorance. He could have said, do you hunt raccoons? Would that have been a totally different thing from saying, you hunt coons? How many of you think that would be different? Absolutely, he could have said raccoons, but he didn't. He had no, he had never been around people with other color groups. And it wasn't a man anyway. He learned something at that moment. Number one, he learned, watch your mouth, Dad. Watch your mouth. They went hunting and they all got, they all filled their, their limit. They all got their limit. Because we have lots of pheasants in northeast Iowa. If you want to go hunting, let me know, and I'll tell you where there are 160 acres that you can hunt on. But only on my part of that 160 acres, okay? <laughs> I walked in my flat, my flat in my house. I was ironing the teepee. I, I, after I heard both of these ugly questions, I rolled the teepee up and threw it into the bottom of the closet, closed the closet door, and when my husband came home from work, I said, he, he put his arms around me, he said, they shot Martin Luther King Jr. And, and I was crying. And he said, what are you going to do, Jane? I said, I'm going to do what Hitler did. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm going to teach my students the Sioux Indian prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I walk a mile in his moccasins. But I'm also going to arrange for them to walk in the shoes of a child of color in my room for a day. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to separate my students according to the color of their eyes. Because that's what Hitler did. One of the ways they decided who went into the gas chamber was eye color. If you had a good German name but you had brown eyes, they thought you must be a Jewish person who was trying to pass, so they threw you into the gas chamber. Or if you were a child, they threw you up in the air and used you for target practice. It happened then. How many of you think it could happen here now? Oh yeah. oh yeah. It happens in this country every time a black child with a little toy gun, wooden gun in his hand, is walking across the playground and some white policeman shoots him. Yeah. And I'm angry. And my husband said, you better not do that. I said, why not? He said, you'll lose your job. I said, if I lose my job for doing this with my students, I don't want to teach in Resco. He said, Jane, we need that income. I said, I'll find another way. He was just absolutely terrified because he knew he'd been around those guys driving back and forth to the out of plant in Charles City. He knew what he was dealing with and what I would be dealing with. I didn't know. Nobody talked in racist ways to me because they didn't dare, because I would challenge them. I would confront them and I would refuse to, to tolerate it. But he knew. So before I went to bed that night, I finally, I said the only prayer I ever say anymore, I said, oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Oh Lord, make me an instrument of that piece. I said it over and over like a mantra. Right. People, within 15 minutes after I started that exercise the next day, I learned something very valuable. 
Be very, very careful what you pray for. You might get it. And you might find out that was precisely what you did not want. If I had known about the racism in Riceville, Iowa, I wouldn't have done that exercise. If I had known that my children, my four children who went to school in that system, were going to be spit on, their belongings were going to be destroyed, they were going to be verbally and physically abused by their peers, by their teachers, and by the parents of their peers, because my children had an N-word lover for a mother, I wouldn't have done that exercise. If I would, had known that my parents would lose their business because nobody would eat in the restaurant owned by the people who raised the town's only N-word lover, I wouldn't have done that exercise. If my, I had known that my, father, my husband would lose all of his friends the day after I did that exercise because nobody wanted to be seen talking to the person who couldn't control his N-word loving wife, I wouldn't have done that exercise. I wouldn't have done that to my father or to my mother, or to my husband. I wouldn't have done that to my children. However, if I had known that no teacher would speak to me for 12 years in that system, where they could be seen speaking to me, because it wasn't good politics to be seen talking to the N-word lover, if I had known that was going to happen, I might have done the exercise sooner. <laughs> I found out that I had a whole lot more time to teach when I was no longer included in their hall conferences. And my internal environment was a lot less polluted when I no longer had to listen to their racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, ethnocentric statements. But I didn't know. And so I said the prayer. And the next morning I got up as I left for work. My husband said, you better be careful, Jane, you're going to lose your job. I said, I'll see you tonight. We'll see what happens. He said, you better be careful, you're going to lose your job. It's like he had a new mantra. You better be careful, you're going to lose your job. He said it until he died, not too long. I years ago, still saying, Jay, you better be careful, you're going to lose your job. And I said, take this check to the bank and shut up about it. You better be careful, you're going to lose your job. I went into my classroom, the first student in the room, Stephen Armstrong, came in and said, hey, Elliot, they shot that king last night. Why did they shoot that king? They said, we're going to talk about it, Stephen. So after we had done the things we had to do first thing in the morning, first we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. How many of you learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? How many of you learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag without the words under God in it? Every older where you learned the Pledge of Allegiance to fly without the words under God, and I'll bet you did. You with those lovely big glasses. You learned the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag without the words under God in it originally, right? Say yes, Mrs. Elliot. <laughs> yes, you did. Ah, people. We said the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag for, without the words under God until about 1953, when Dwight Eisenhower became President of the United States, and the Knights of Columbus lobbied the government to get the words under God inserted into the pledge, thereby making it into a little prayer. Every child has to get up in the morning, put his hand over his heart, so little boys have movable hearts and they all end up in the same place. That's, that's where their hearts are, you know it as well as I do. And say, yeah, pledge of allegiance. That poor man, he's thinking, why did we hire this witch? People. A pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic of which stand one nation, and the, under God, indivisible, is liberty and justice for all. Under God does not belong in the pledge. Make no mistake about this. How many of you know people who are atheists and do not believe in God? How many of you think they have the right not to say under God in the pledge? How many of you think we even charge atheists? How many think they have to pay income tax and real estate tax and send their children to school until they're at least 16? then why do we insult, we insult them by putting the words under God in the pledge? Now, I don't care what your religion is, but you don't have the right to force it on everybody else in the world, okay? After we say, did that, then we sang, God bless America. <laughs> what did you sing, God bless America? Who are you talking to? What? God. And what are you asking God to do? So when you sing, God bless America, you are praying. How many of you think we shouldn't be singing God bless America in the schools in the morning? It doesn't belong there, people. You have no right to force your religion. You're going, no, no, no. It's perfectly all right for us to force our religion on other people. If you're going to live in this country, you're going to be a Christian. And that's more bar dirt. You ought to be able to live in this country without being a Christian. Now, I'll tell you why I know that. The Pope said. How many of you know what a Pope is? <laughs> Yeah. The Pope said several years ago, you can't be a Christian and a racist. The two are mutually exclusive. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to give up 
your racism. If you're going to be a racist, you have to give up Christianity. Now, how many of you know somebody who will give up their Christianity before they'll give up their racism? Oh, I know a whole mess of them. Because they know that racism is stronger than Christianity in the United States of America. And if it isn't, then why do we have more children attending segregated schools today than we had previous to Brown versus Board of Education? We have them because Christians aren't following what it says in the Bible. Judge not that ye be not judged. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Insomuch ye have done it unto one of these, my brethren, so have ye done it unto me. We are all members of the family of man. And it also says in the Bible that Jesus had feet of bronze and kinky woolly hair. <laughs> how many of you folks have ever seen? I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how to solve some problems here. How many of you get Christmas cards? How many of you know somebody who gets lots of Christmas cards? How many of you know somebody who's really tired right now with those Christmas cards? I'll tell you how to deal with that. Go down to the store and buy a pack of Christmas cards that have the Holy Family on them. Mary with her blonde, her pale face, and her blonde hair peeking out under her headband, and her blue eyes, and the baby Jesus looking just like a little Pillsbury Doughboy. Take those cards home and color them right. <laughs> and then send them out. Next year, you won't have to send any Christmas cards. <laughs> We white folks don't want to see somebody that we can't relate to when we pray. We don't want to pray to somebody with dark skin and dark hair and dark eyes. We want somebody that is an old white man with a long gray beard that looks like Charles and Heston playing Moses. <laughs> People, imagine what it is, how ignorant we are. God is a spirit that has neither color nor gender. God is a spirit and has neither color nor gender. You got it? He isn't an old white man with a long gray beard. And there's another little aspect. Every time I speak to a group, somebody says, well, what about, what about the creation story? They don't want to hear about evolution. What about the creation story? How many of you know the creation story? The biblical creation story. Yeah. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. And it's true. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, God picked up some dirt, right? And he turned it into a two-legged creature without any hair or without hair, fur, or feathers, okay? We walk on two legs. The dirt in the Garden of Eden was made out of rotten vegetation, palm fronds. When vegetation rots, it turns either very dark brown or black. So the first person created by God was obviously a black male. He made the first woman out of what? Adam's ribs. Uh -huh. All bone tissue is white because it's made out of calcium. Mm -hmm. So the first couple made by God, according to the Bible, was a black man and a white woman. How do you like me <laughs> If you're going to preach that book to me, you better realize that I'm going to take and I'm going to ruin your faith in the rightness of whiteness. People, it's time to get over it. The Bible, according to the Pope, several months ago, he said, the things that are in the Bible are nice moral stories. They are not fact. You got it? So white folks, you don't have to worry anymore. It wasn't a black man or a white woman. And somebody says, God made man in God's own image, so evidently God must be a black man. <laughs> People. It doesn't mean that God made human to look like God. It means God imagined a creature that could walk on two feet and had some have some intelligence. How many of you know some creatures who walk on two feet who don't have a whole lot of intelligence? <laughs> now folks, if you haven't read the book Sapien, S-A-P-I-E-N, get it and read it. The man wrote the history of humankind, and it's called Sapien, which means Homo sapien. Read that book. And before you read that book, get the book, The Myth of Race, by Robert Wall Sussman. 
it will blow you away because it will tell you the truth about what we've been doing, what we are doing, and what we're going to do more of unless we change this situation. Once my kids got sat down after we had done our prayer and prayed for the day, I said, well, how, how many of you know anything about Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, I've come off and raise their hands because I taught them about Martin Luther King Jr. We talked and we talked and we talked. I could tell these kids weren't learning a thing. I finally said, look, kids, do you have any idea how to be, to be something other than white in this country? No. Would you like to know? Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, boy, let's keep this blog top and we don't have to learn anything all day long. We've already gotten out of spelling and handwriting. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the more question. I said, fine. I think today we're going to give some of you the opportunity to feel, find out how it feels to be other than white in the United States of America. I said, today we're going to judge people by the color of their eyes. And immediately, one of them said, what do you mean? I said, I mean blue-eyed people are smart as brown-eyed people. I'm blue-eyed. I didn't dare have the blue-eyed be on top the first day. Blue-eyed people are smart as brown-eyed people. They are as clean as brown-eyed people. They are as civilized as brown-eyed people. You give blue-eyed people something nice, what do they do with it? What do they do with it? What? Mess it up. Why? Why do they mess it up? She'll turn it off in a little while. <laughs> she must be blue-eyed. Why do they mess it up? <laughs> she is. Look at She's covering her eyes so I can't see it. I can tell what color your eyes are from a distance, honey, by the way you behave. <laughs> but why do blue-eyed people mess things up? I'll wait. What? They're born that way, or they learn to be that way? They learn to be that way from other blue-eyed people. Immediately, immediately, little Debbie Hughes is sitting in the front row, looked up at me, and she she was cross-eyed, so one eye went that way, and the other went that way. And I'm not making fun of her people, but that's what she looked like this. And she had buck teeth because she didn't have any braces yet. Her teeth were sticking out here and her eyes were doing this. And then there she looked up at me and said, how come you're the teacher here if you've got them blue eyes? And I thought, well, you little shit. <laughs> now I know you would have thought, well, you little scallywag or you little, you little urchin. But no, that isn't what I thought. And then immediately, Alan Moss, blue-eyed Alan Moss, stood up in the back row and said, oh, I, oh, Debbie, if she didn't have those blue eyes, blue eyes, she'd be the principal of the superintendent. They're both brown-eyed. And that quickly I knew that my blue-eyed, my white, brown, and blue-eyed children knew exactly how racism works. I didn't know that I had been teaching racism ever since I got into that classroom. I watched horrendous things happen in my classroom that day. I had taken all the child psychology courses. I thought I knew about expectations. I had four dyslexic, I had sex, seven dyslexic boys in my room that year. Four of them were brown-eyed. On the day those brown-eyed boys were on the top in that exercise, they read words I knew they couldn't read, and they spelled words I knew they couldn't spell. And at the end of the day, brown-eyed Billy Thompson came up to my, my desk and said, Miss Elliot, where's my spelling paper? I said, what do you want it for, Billy? He said, I want to take it home and show it to my mother. She thinks I can't spell, and I can. He didn't find out until April 5th of his third grade year that he could spell. And I didn't find out that he could either because he had been living down to my expectations of him. And I knew what to expect of him because of what his other teachers, his previous teachers, had said about him and his older brother and his father in the teacher's lounge of the Riceville Community Elementary School. There should be a sign over the door of every teacher's lounge in every school in the United States of America. And it should say, caution, contents herein may be hazardous to students' health. Horrible expectations are laid down for students by teachers, not educators, but teachers in, in teachers' lounges in the United States of America. On the other hand, I had in my classroom that year a blue-eyed girl who came in at, in February reading at the sixth grade level. She had a mind like a steel trap. She was absolutely brilliant. She was tall. She was fair-skinned. She had blonde hair. She had blue eyes reading at the sixth grade level when she came to my room. On the day she was on the bottom in that exercise, that brilliant child walked with her shoulders hunched as if to ward off an expected blow. She stumbled when she crossed the classroom. She made mistakes in reading. She made mistakes in spelling. And she forgot how to multiply. And I know why. And I knew why then. She had to live down to my expectations of her. Now, how many of you have seen the film The Eye of the Storm? How many of you haven't seen that film? Oh, for the love of him. 
20 minutes to 12. What time do we have to be done here? Anybody know? What does this mean? What? 20 minutes. I have to be done in 20 minutes? I can't possibly be done in 20 minutes. I want you to know that. Yeah? One thing I can do in just 20 minutes, and this ain't it. Not <laughs> I can get my hair cut in 20 minutes. What are you thinking about? Shame, shame, shame. The devil knows your name. <laughs> Getting that wrong. I was shocked at what happened to that brilliant girl that day. She came in from recess crying. I said, what's going on here? As she walked across the playground, two brown-eyed Debbies and a brown-eyed Cindy stepped up behind her. One of them reached up, struck her across the back with her far up forearm, and when Carol turned around, Debbie said to her, Now you have to apologize to me for getting in my way, because I'm better than you are. And she apologized and came in crying. Like some black folks say thank you when somebody says to them, When I see you, I don't see you black. Never do that. Never again. Never say thank you. You need to say, and if you have some other problems, because <laughs> their main problem is ignorance. And you don't have to put up with their ignorance, but they will maintain that ignorance as long as you let them. As long as you say yes sir, no sir, yeah, yes ma'am, yes ma'am. They will let you put up with that, and that is just implicit bias. That's total ignorance. And the main thing that people of color have to do for white folks in this country is teach them. You have to educate them. You have to lead us out of ignorance because we don't know what we're doing. And we only know what we've been taught. And what we've been taught is racism. I went down to the teacher's lounge at noon that day because I was just, I was just horrified by what I was seeing. And the reason I was horrified was those kids were exhibiting the behaviors that I and the other significant adults in their environment had modeled for them. I watched those little brown-eyed kids become me for a day. And it made me sick, literally sick to my stomach. So I went down to the teacher's lounge at noon to share with the other two third grade teachers what was happening in my classroom. I needed some support. In the, in the teacher's lounge there were about ten teachers in the lounge, and the other two third grade teachers were two of them. One of those third grade teachers was about 52, 53 at the time. The other was over 62, had been molding young man's minds in the Riceville School for over 30 years. I told them what was happening in my classroom the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. The younger of those two said, I don't know how you have time to, all, to do all that extra stuff. It's all I can do to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, if you haven't got reading, writing, and arithmetic yet, you might as well have done the extra stuff. The other one said, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. I can still, still see her there. Frizzy gray hair, heavy, sitting there like, mm. And she said, on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I don't know why you're doing that. I thought it was about time somebody shot that son of a bitch. Oh. Nobody gasped. Nobody said, oh. Every one of those other so-called educated instructors either smiled or laughed and nodded because she had expressed their feelings perfectly and as the most senior member of the group, she had the most right to do so. I went back to my classroom determined that no student of any age will ever leave my presence with those attitudes unchallenged. If you want to be a racist, you go ahead and be a racist, but you bring it to me, and you will learn very, very shortly that your problem is ignorance. It isn't skin color, it's ignorance about skin color. I will not tolerate it. L. Wiesel says you must not tolerate the intolerable. If what is happening in this country is intolerable for my black cousins, it is intolerable for me. In so much as you have done it unto one of these, my brethren, so have ye done it unto me, and I will not tolerate. And you don't have to apologize. You don't have to applaud that because that's. We should all feel that way about this people. That isn't something that you should applaud. That is something that you should, by God, expect. We should expect one another to respect one another. And we should expect one another to show that respect instead of this ugly intolerance. And if you think we are living in a post-racial society, you better look at our president. You cannot, in a post-racial society, elect a man who is a decent loudly and proclaims that he's a racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic, ethnocentric, Hemorrhoid. <laughs> I don't say able because that's not, everybody needs one of those. But nobody needs a hemorrhoid. <laughs> this man.
man is a hemorrhoid. And we need to do surgery. How many of you are going to vote in the next election in two and a half weeks? People, we can change this thing by going to the polls. If they will let you vote, you should vote. And if they won't let you vote, you should riot. You should put a stop to this nonsense, and you can put a stop to this nonsense by going to the polls in vast numbers. People of color, you are going to be running this show within 30 years. Within 30 years, people of color will be running this show. You've got to get ready for running the show. And you need to start now. You need to start practicing now. You need to make this a better place for your children and your grandchildren than it is today. What you do in the present will create the future. We can, we can change the future by what we do today. I was absolutely terrified by what happened in my classroom, so I, have to, I, didn't, I didn't clean it up when the kids went home. It was on Friday. I didn't tell my lie to you today. I sent them home. I went to my mother's hotel and I told her what was happening in my classroom. And she said, Jane, you better be careful. You don't mind. I end up where I used it. I said, where did Aunt Eunice end up? In the mental institution. <laughs> what I was describing sounded insane. Because people, when you create a microcosm of society in a small group, and you pick them out on the basis of a physical characteristic over which you have no control, that's what we do in this larger society 24-7. You need to realize that was, that's what's going on. And people say to me, how about that experiment that you did? I said, no, 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 no. Don't call what I did an experiment. Because if what I do, when I separate people according to a physical characteristic over which they have no control, if that's an experiment, then what we have been doing in this society for the last 400 years is an experiment we ought to put a stop to it. It's illegal and unethical to experiment with people without their knowledge or without their permission. So if what I do in my classroom is an experiment, then what we're doing in this society is an experiment. And I want to stop, I want to stop now. Because the people who are running it do not know what in the devil they're doing. And we're really in a severe problem about that. I went, I went home. I've never had anything ugly happen in my house before, and I didn't have then. It didn't happen to my house. It happened to my children. My children, there are still saliva, but where no Elliot is allowed to walk. Because you're all inward lovers. And I say, thank you very much. Better a lover than a hater. As far as I'm concerned, that's a comment. Right. The second year, the second day of that exercise, the kids came back in on Monday. I re reversed the exercise. I said, I lied to you kids on Friday. Mm. What do you mean? I said, I mean, I found out that I was wrong. I read a couple books. And blue-eyed people are inferior, they're superior. Blue-eyed people are smarter than brown-eyed people. They're clearer than brown-eyed people. They're more civilized than brown-eyed people. And immediately, immediately it turned around. Immediately, my blue-eyed people came, became really, really smart. And my brown-eyed people could not do on Monday what they had been able to do excellently on Friday. Because I told them they couldn't succeed, and they didn't succeed. At the end, but one noticeable difference. My blue-eyed people were much less vicious to the brown-eyed people than the brown-eyed people had been to them. In the boys' room that on Friday, the kids, the boys had talked about what they're going to do with those blue-eyed people. When, when the blue-eyed people got on top, they, they, the blue-eyed people said that they were going to do the brown-eyed people because they were on the bottom. The day they were on the top, they were much less vicious to the brown-eyed people than the brown-eyed people had been to them. After we got it all together, we got in a circle to talk about what had happened. I said to this group, why didn't you blue-eyed people mistreat the brown-eyed people the way they did you? And those kids said, almost in a chorus, because I didn't want to make anybody feel as bad as I felt when I was on the bottom. Now that's the only hope that white folks have. The people of color do not want to do unto us as we have done unto them. White people, you had better pray to your white god with a long gray beard that looks like Trump and has been playing Moses. That people of color are more forgiving than we have taught them to be. I can't believe that anybody would live the way we force black people in this country to live, and that they would want to make other people feel that way. I can't believe that white people want to make people of other color groups feel the way we force them to feel and the way we force them to learn. If you haven't read, uh, what's his name? 
Nathan Rothstein's book, The Racial Conditioning of Our Children. Get that book. You'll have a hard time getting it because it's out of print. The man was brilliant. You have to read that book. It's probably out in the other room. See if it's, it isn't in my purse. And also, if you haven't read this copy, the April issue of the National Geographic magazine, get this magazine. Steal it if you have to. <laughs> get this magazine. Go to the library. The library is supported by your tax dollars. So go and sign this out and never bring it back. <laughs> and say, Jane Elliott told me I could take this and then run like hell. Now, you need to, you need to see this. See these two children? These are twin girls. These are twin girls. Their parents' pictures are in here. Also in here is a history of how people got colorless. And how we got colorless is black people, brilliant black people who were creative and courageous and curious, left the area near the equator and moved north. And as they moved north, their bodies produced less and less melanin, so their skin got lighter and lighter and lighter. And so did their hair, and so did their eyes. But these people that we have described as, described as being less than in this country for 400 years were able to navigate the world without any modern technology. Now you tell me how they could do that. Just tell me how they could do it. They could do it because they're smarter than we have ever been allowed to believe. They are still smarter than we are allowed to believe. We'll be unto you if you're black and you succeed. We'll find a way to figure out that you cheated to do it. We will call a black man, who you think is our first black president, a non-citizen. Yep. Barack Obama was a citizen of the United States, people. Yeah. But he was born where? In Hawaii? And everybody knows that's an island surrounded by a lot of water, like we don't pay any attention to Puerto Rico, because that's an island surrounded by a lot of water, and it's real hard to get to those folks. Oh my God. Now, who was our first black president? Who was our first black president? Both? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was our first black president. He was part black, he was part white, and he was part Cherokee Indian. He was a Melungeon. There was a whole mess of them in Kentucky, and he was one of them, people. And get a picture in your mind of what Abraham Lincoln looked like. He had Indian hair, and he had limbs, long legs and arms and hands. He looked like something other than a typical white man, because he was other than a typical white man. He was our first black president. Now, how many of you think that the Republican Party which calls itself the party of Lincoln, will be changing its name shortly. <laughs> when they find out that Abraham Lincoln was a black and white and Native American man, they're going to find another name for the Republican Party. People, those black people populated every landmass on the face of the earth. And the only reason white people have white skin is because their bodies didn't produce as much melanin because they weren't as exposed to as much sunlight. Right. White people need lots of sunlight so that their bodies can produce vitamin D as a result of being, being exposed to lots of sunlight. How many of you knew that? How many of you didn't know that? How many of you think you'd better teach? Should you have known that? Should you teach that to your children? Do you have children? Well, if you don't have children, go get some and teach them. <laughs> People, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. And if you teach black children in such a way that they are forced to believe that they can't succeed, they'll live down to your expectations of them. And then you'll blame it on the color of their skin. And you'll allow, allow some teacher to blame it on the color of their skin. Because we've got a lot of ignorant black and white teachers teaching in this country. It isn't just white people who believe this. And it isn't just white people who teach it. Black teachers teach it too. They've done studies that prove that the teachers who are more upset by the kids who exceed their expectations than they are by the kids who fail, by the, those who live down to their expectations of them. If a black kid succeeds in school, especially if it's a boy, he's in trouble, unless he is an athlete. 
and let's talk about an athlete. Let's talk about Carlin, Colin Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Colin Kaepernick won't stand and absolute the United States flag while they're playing the Star Spangled Banner. How many of you have ever saluted the Star Spangled Banner? How many of you salute during the Star Spangled Banner? How many of you stand during the Star Spangled Banner? How many of you are aware that the Star Spangled Banner that we sing, the first verse is what we sing, the second verse is blatantly, overtly racist? Get a copy of it and read it, and you won't salute the Star Spangled Banner either. The last line of the Star Spangled Banner says, Oh, say, is that Star Spangled Banner that way for the land of the free? And that means those white folks in the stands that can afford to buy the tickets. That's the land of the free. And the home of the brave, that's those black men on that, men on that field who put themselves out there in danger of all kinds of concussions and all kinds of bodily injury in order to make enough money in the short number of years they're able to play that in that athletic competition. And you think they're making a lot of money. Their health is being ruined, but they're brave enough to do it. We're living in the land of the free, that means me, and the home of the brave, that means every black woman in this room and in this country. I will not forget, probably as long as I live, I had a tall white male and tall black female standing on each side of me several months ago at the University of Indiana. As we were talking about differences, and some ridiculous white woman says, I think we should talk, stop talking about differences and talk about similarities. Similarities are more important than differences. I thought, oh, drop dead fool. But I didn't say that because you're not supposed to say it even if you're thinking it. I said, let me show you something about that. So I had this tall white man stand on one side, tall white female stand on the other, and I said, now, you folks see any differences? What was the first thing they said? Height. Every time I do it, that's the first thing they say. So I said to this tall white man, there's your hiding part, you? Mm, not really. Were you born this way? Yeah. Is this an award? No. A physical characteristic over which you have no control? Well, yeah. Does your height give you power? Yeah. Okay, so you have power because of height, a physical characteristic over which you have no control. So I said to the black woman, and she was taller than he was. I said, is your height important to you? She said, well, yeah. Does it give you power? No. I said, okay. She said, because there are some other issues. I said, we're going to deal with them. So I said, do you see any other differences here other than height? So they all said sex. So I said to this white man, is sex important to you? And then he turned red, so I turned him into a man of color right away. And I said, wait, <laughs> let me put that another way. Is the fact that you're male important to you? Yes. Did you earn it? No. Is it a physical characteristic over which you have no control? Yes. Does being male give you power? Yes. Two, two physical characteristics over which you have no control because of which she has power. So I asked the black woman the same thing. No, her gender doesn't give her power, and, but there are some other issues. Okay, so then they dealt with age. Well, that was interesting. So then I said, do you see any other differences here? Now, people, what are these folks trying to do? We're trying not to talk about it, not to mention it. We have been taught that it's a bad thing to see skin color, and if you do see it, to mention it. Pretend it doesn't exist. I have a lot of friends who look like you. Yeah. Sure, some of my best friends are black. Uh-huh. So I said, <laughs> I said, how many of you have heard that one? I've got a lot of friends who are black. And you say to them, and you take them to church with you? <laughs> no, you don't, because you're smart enough to keep your mouth shut. See, I'm not that smart, I say. And you go to church with them, or do you have them over for bridge? Well, you know they don't want to be with me. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're right, then you know. Anyway, so I said to this man, it's just get the, the, some woman said, somebody said color. And I said, thank you very much, because usually they say race. Then I really raise hell about that. Color. I said, are you talking about skin color or hair color? Skin color. So I said to this tall white man, is your skin color important to you? He said, I never have to think about it. That's what he said. I never have to think about it. And I knew he'd say it, because that's the way it happens every time I do that with three people, two people. How would you like never to have to think about the color of your skin? How many of you would like that? How many of you think that would be a step forward in this country? If it was all right just to be what you are, would that be remarkable? Yes. Is that what we ought to be aiming for? Yes. People, we're all members of the same race, but we come in different colors. There are 2,500 different skin colors on the face of the earth. 
If you can think up 2,500 different names for races, you've got too much time on your hands. You ought to be doing something else. I was, I couldn't believe it. I said, uh, does your skin color give you power? Yeah, I've got lots of power. I said, is there anything you're afraid of? No. I said, can you go and do and say and be whatever you want to, as long as you stay within the confines of the law? Yes, I don't fear anything. I said, okay. So I said to this black woman, sometimes it takes courage for you to get out of bed in the morning. And she paused and then she said, I'm going to say something I've never said out loud before because I'm ashamed of it. And they just sick of me. I said, and that would be? She said, I have two children. They're both daughters. Both times when I was pregnant, I prayed that I wouldn't have a son. And I said, and that's because? She said, because I didn't want to think about what he'd have to go through and what I'd have to go through when I lost him. And she didn't say, if I lost him. She said, when I lost him. You could have heard a feather fall in that room. The only sound you'd hear was that. Paul White Man, but and I thought, cry, you SOB. If you haven't learned anything here today from me, you better have learned it from this woman. And I said to that group, what the hell have we done? When a white woman has a, is pregnant, she wants to have a son, and many times to carry on the family name. When a black woman is pregnant, in many cases she prays that she won't have a son because she knows that in this country, he may not live to carry on the family name. This is a crime against humanity, people, and we're committing it on a daily basis in the name of Christianity. Now, we want to go through these. How many races are there on the face of the earth? One. one. If you wrote a number other than one on question number one, give yourself an F. <laughs> number two, racism is A, genetic, or B, a learned response? B, it is a learned response. Nobody is born a racist. There is no gene for racism, sexism, ageism, homophobia, or ethnocentrism. Those are all things you have to be carefully, carefully taught. Number three, what do we call those whose parents are of different color groups? Mosaic. Not biracial because there's only one race. You can't be biracial if you came from this planet. So when somebody says to you, I'm a biracial extract, you say, oh, where are which of your parents came from outer space? And then you have to explain to them that a mosaic is something new that is made of many different elements. Now you won't find that in the dictionary, according, you know, as it means, as it connected to race, but mosaic is a better word than multiracial or interracial or biracial because there's only one race. Number four, you believe in the golden rule or the platinum rule? A is the golden rule, B is the platinum rule. Which one's right? B, the platinum rule. If you got that wrong, give yourself another F. Number five, the problem which encourages racism is A, stupidity, B, ignorance. B, ignorance. Number six, racism has been around A, forever, B, 500 years. 500 years it was started with the Spanish Inquisition. Before the Spanish Inquisition, it was ordered to be whatever, all right to be whatever color you are. We deliberately, during the Spanish Inquisition, remember, people who were running the Spanish Inquisition were killing Jews. They had killed several, several thousand people before they realized that they were killing some Christians. They couldn't tell what their religion was, so they didn't realize they were killing people who were Jews. So then they decided they set up, they'd find another way to decide who to kill or enslave, and they set upon skin color. So if you didn't put 500 years, fix it. It's only been around for about 500 years. And if you read the myth, the book, The Myth of Race, you'll realize that. Number seven, the cure for racism is A, and education B, indoctrination. A, education. You'll never cure it as long as all you're doing is indoctrinating people. Number eight, I have read The Myth of Race by Sussman. How many of you checked that one? Okay. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. One. It wasn't that good. What's it? Boynton. Uh, Browder. Anthony Browder. Fantastic. We all agree to people. Number C, They Came Before Columbus. How many of you read it? Interesting book. Fantastic. Now, number nine. What is the opposite of gay? They're wrong. I have gay and lesbian relatives and friends. The opposite of gay in this country is said is straight people. The opposite of straight is bent, misshapen, or crooked. My members of the LGBTQ society are not 
bent, misshapen, or crooked. You got it? They are staid. S-T-A-I-D. It is the opposite of gay in the thesaurus. How many of you know what a thesaurus is? And for you, go to your thesaurus and look up gay and you'll find stay as one of the opposites. Now people, it starts with the same first two letters, S-T, the same long A sound spelled A-Y, A-I, and it has no negative connotation. How many of you think we should start saying that people like me are stayed instead of straight? Why isn't your hand up? How many of you think it would be a good idea in the future to refer to heterosexuals as stayed instead of straight? Why isn't your hand up? Art? In a sweatshirt. See, you're in the wrong suit. You should have on a suit instead of that sweatshirt. <laughs> people, people who are not gay are stayed. They are not straight. You got it? So, number nine, you probably flunk. Now, add up your scores. <laughs> How many of you got nine points right? How many of you didn't? How many of you got five right? How many of you got two right? One? People? This is what you came here for today, whether or not you realize it. I'm an educator. When you leave here today, you should know more than when you came in here. Now, how many of you learned something in the last hour and a half? Thank you very much. Then how many of you would vote to give me my check? <laughs> You. You, you have been a really marvelous audience. I would advise you to get the film, The Eye of the Storm. Go to the local library or the local college library. Check out the film, The Eye of the Storm. And if you have children or grandchildren or nieces or nephews or neighbors next door, show them that film. Let them see how white people react to one day of being treated the way people of color in this country are treated for a lifetime and realize how superior black students are to white students in view of the ugly things we do to them all day long. And they keep on keeping up. I don't know how they do it. Thank you very much. You've been excellent. Thank you, Cousin Jane. Listen, guys, we're not done yet. There is a about a 30-minute Q&A session, and then Supervisor Prince and Rally is going to Good. Yes, yes, yes. So we've asked for you all to uh, fill out a letter, but how is it that you didn't take to those same kind of racial teachings? Can you explain that? I grew up instead of growing older. Lots of people grow older. Some people grow up. When you grow up, you give up those childish. And when I became a man, I put away childish things. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I entertained uh, something as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away those childish things. You realize when you've had a father like mine who said, never judge a book by its cover. And he said, never, never stump, and only a fool stumbles on something behind him. And he considered racism something behind us. And we should stop stumbling over it. And my father said, a fair thing is a pretty thing, and a right wrongs no man. And I also read Bell Hooks' first books. Bell Hooks, how many of you know who Bell Hooks is? You'd ought to read her first books, not the last ones, because the last ones were all about love. Now, let me ask you a question. I'm going to form a new society, and in this society, you are going to be guaranteed either love or justice. If you get love, you won't get justice. If you get justice, you might not get love. Now, how many of you would vote to be guaranteed love? That's damn foolishness. Can, how many of you have had some white person say to you right after they've said something in here, well, you know I love you. How many of you have had that one? How many of you had a father who gave you a whooping and said, I'm doing this because I love you? And how many of you thought, I wish you loved me a little less, Dad? People, we have a society in which we talk love all the time. I love chocolate cake. I adore my husband. I adore my children. There's something I don't want to use, I don't want to consume. I don't want to throw away if they do the wrong thing. If we have a society in which we say we love people but don't provide justice, they will not love us and they will not treat us justly. So we've got to, we've got to have a society that believes in justice. If, if 
you treat me justly, I'll treat you justly, and Mel Brooks says, if we start treating one another justly, we might end up with a loving society. If we don't, we won't. How many of you then would vote for justice? And we can guarantee justice, people. It's in the Constitution. And it's also in the Bible that we teach so happily. Is that the last question? Uh, no, that's the first one, cousin. So, second question. This is asking for a friend again. He has lots of friends who ask strange questions, don't he? <laughs> okay, cousin, go for it. Can you offer a few ways a high-quality education might better prepare K-12 grade American children of color for the challenges of the 21st century systemic racism? Oh my God, that's a long question. Okay, here's the answer. Go to my website, jane at janeelliot.com. Download the printed language, printed learning materials. The first page is a set of typical statements that white folks make. On that page are statements that you've all heard. I hope I don't have it with me, so I'm, it's here in here somewhere. I'm not going to Here's a list of typical statements. How many of you have ever, you have ever heard, them, heard this? To a minority. No matter what I say or do, it doesn't suit you. You're never satisfied. As far as you're concerned, I can't do anything right. How many of you have ever had a white person say something like that to you? How about this one? Love can't be legislated. How about this one? Every person should be judged solely on the basis of his or her accomplishments, regardless of race. How many of you have heard it and then seen it not practice it? I don't understand what you people are saying. How many of you have heard that one? Three weeks ago, I was on Jada Pinkett Smith's Red Table. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Well, I didn't know until I got there. And she brought a white woman down who works for her company to, so they have a white, the white person's, a white woman's uh, perspective on race. Almost the first thing that white woman said was, I just don't understand black people. <laughs> And I'm standing back outside listening to this, and I think, oh, I'm going to kill her. I'm going to kill her. And this black guy's standing there, and I just wrote down El Crapo. And I stood there and wrote notes as this white woman made the most ignorant statements that I've heard in many years to Jada Pinkett Smith, who's black, and who has the most absolutely adorable husband on the face of the earth. <laughs> And whose daughter looks exactly like him. Yeah. And is brilliant. And a mother who is brilliant. And here's Jada. Uh, uh, I thought, oh my God. And so I said to the guy standing there, look, if I'm not um, up there in that, at that table within three minutes, I'm going home. I didn't come here to listen to this nonsense. So he, pretty soon, they ran me down there. And they ran that woman over there and had her sit on the other side. I tell you. The first thing Jane Pinkett Smith said to me was something like, well, Jane, what do you think about this so far? I said, you know, Jada, you got a brilliant daughter and a brilliant mother, but you need some help. That was not the way to address the hostess, right? I should have said how nice it is that you invited me to be here. But every woman that that white, every word that that white woman said was taken as if it were gospel because it came out of a white mouth. She shouldn't have allowed that. She should have said, wait a minute, if you don't understand blacks, Here's a list of books that you can read. You go to my website, people, and you'll find a list of books that you can read. One of them is, and it isn't on that website because I've only read it in the last few years, The Myth of Race by Robert Paul Sussman. The Browder book, uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. You better read that book. Whitney Young's. Just look up Whitney Young's name. You'll find the, the uh, title of the book. There's a list of commitments to combat racism. What you do if you are people of your black persuasion, if you have black skin and you have white relatives, neighbors, whatever, who make these ridiculous statements, you get that list of commitments to combat racism. Go through it, check yes, those that you have done, check no, those that you haven't done, then go back and circle. I'm talking about white people doing this. Then circle one that you check no, put the date beside it, and do it for a month. At the end of the month, take that paper out, see what what changes you made as a result of doing that one thing, write some notes to yourself about what you learned by doing that, and then circle another one and do that for a month. If every white person in the United States of America would go through, the, I think there are 18 commitments to combat racism, 
We could change the level of racism in this country in two generations. I haven't a doubt in my mind about that because the students who went through the blue eyed, brown eyed exercise in third grade are raising their children differently than the, their peers are and in a different way than their brothers and sisters are. They are changed as a result of going through that exercise for one day. People, we change black children all day, every day, and not in a positive way because we put it through the skin color exercise all day, every day. And we think the damage is only being done to black people. It isn't. It's being done to white people too. We don't have, we don't associate with those who are different from ourselves. Think of the joy, the companionship, the learning that white people lose by refusing to be around those who are different from themselves. It just makes me sick. And as a result of that, my daughter married a Saudi Arabian. Do not marry a Saudi Arabian. <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer your question? I mean, he's gorgeous, but he doesn't know shit from a good grade of clay. <laughs> I didn't say that, and you didn't hear it. So, Frederick Douglass said, I'm going to say this because we're going to get done here. Frederick Douglass said, and incidentally, I'm getting the Frederick Douglass Medal for Freedom. <laughs> I think it's the first time they've given them. There are 200 people getting them. Big deal. All right. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. I refuse to put up with this nonsense. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, where ignorance prevails, and where any one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to oppress, rob, and degrade them, neither persons nor property will be safe. You need to remember that, folks. There is no, there is no progress without struggle. We've got to get together. White people who care and people of color have got to get together as members of the human race and put a stop to this nonsense. You're all members of my race, you're all my cousins. Behave yourself. Susan B. Anthony, who did some really ugly things, but she also said, cautious, careful people always casting about to preserve their reputation or social standards never can bring about reform. Those who are really in earnest are willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation and publicly and privately, in season and out, avow their sympathies with, with despised ideas and their advocates and bear the consequences. I don't care what white people think of me. And I don't care what you think of me. What you think of me is up to you. That's yours to deal with. You are responsible for that. I'm not. But I will not spend my life trying to be loved by white people. That is a good, that isn't a good thing to aim for, folks. Because we white folks don't really know how to love. Because we will not admit that all we white folks are is faded black folks. And that's what we are. And I appreciate the black in my DNA. And I appreciate you being willing to listen to me. Now, go home. Thank you very much. Don't go home this year. Give a man a microphone and hang it up. We have about four more questions. Are you willing to listen? Yeah. Go ahead. Go and then after the questions, we're going to have closing remarks from Supervisor Frank and Supervisor. So we invite you to stay for that. Oh, that's good. Don't go home. Don't go home just yet. And if then you tell me these things ahead of time, I wouldn't make those mistakes. Go on. That's the question. We rehearsed this, right, cousin? We did not, and I wish we had. <laughs> All right. Is there a difference from your perspective between racism and prejudice? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm prejudiced where snakes are concerned. I don't like them, and I stay away from them. So prejudice isn't the problem. Prejudice based on ignorance about skin color, that's the problem. People should be prejudiced about some things. Quit eating lots of fat. Quit trading with companies that are here to colonize your country. Quit listening to people who tell lies. Uh, Quit listening to people with orange hair <laughs> who are obviously not homo sapien, but Neanderthal. Yes. 
be prejudiced in that area. Not for all Neanderthals, but those who tell lies. Did I answer your question? Thank you. Go ahead. Do you still keep in touch with the students who are in your classroom during the filming of the class divided? If so, what are they doing? Occupation and how they do Oh, I'm afraid nobody would ask. The third year I did the exercise, it was filmed by ABC. The first year was just the kids and me. The second year, this Canadian Broadcasting Corporation sent somebody down to film it. The third year, it was the ABC sent in a film crew. And that year, when my principal gave me my class role at the beginning of the year, he handed me my class, class role and said, Miss Elliott, these kids are never going to learn to read. Just pass them on and get them out of here. They'll never amount to anything anyway. I said, what? He said, no teachers may able to teach these kids to read, and you aren't going to be able to either. Just do what you can with them. And I thought, well, you've got to have a screw loose. So I went to the block, to the teachers, to the uh, office, and I looked in the cumulative files. And every one of those kids had high math scores and low reading and spelling scores. So I knew immediately that I was dealing with dyslexic kids. I know how to teach the dyslexic child. I have taken a course in Orton Development Phonics, and I can teach that chair to read it out of mouth. And so can any of you who really want to teach reading. You need to take a course in Orton Development Phonics. It is absolutely wonderful. They came in the first day, they were scared to death because they had heard that I was a witch. And in October, they said, we were talking about Dracula, right? And they said, well, you're one of those, aren't you? I said, what? What do you mean? Two little white marks on your neck and everybody says you're a witch. I said, people, I had skin tags and I had them removed. That's why I had those white spots on them. And they all just relaxed. All of a sudden, they realized I wasn't there to suck their blood. <laughs> It was the strangest thing. I didn't know why they were so afraid of me. But if they thought I was, I was a, what is Dracula? <laughs> vampire. They thought I was a vampire. I should have, could have gotten. Anyway, people, these kids were told they couldn't read. Their previous teachers, one of them, had been in school for five years. Kindergarten, pre first, first, second, and now third. She was in school for five years, and she still couldn't speak so you could understand her. She had a language all her own. One of them is a stutter, was a stutter when he came into my classroom. Three of them had been identified as mentally retarded by the Iowa Crippled Children's Clinic. I got 16 of those kids in my classroom and they were all dyslexic. So when they came in, I said, here's the way it is, kids. Other teachers have told you you can't read. They're wrong. I know how to teach you how to read. And you know how to learn how to read because I'm going to show you how to do it. And when you leave here, you'll be reading at, at or above the fourth grade level. And they all look like, you really are crazy, but you're as crazy as they think you I said, no, you will be reading at or above the fourth grade level when you leave here because I know how to teach you how to read. When they left my classroom nine months later, they were all reading from the fourth to, and their independent reading level was the sixth grade level. Because I know how to teach every child how to read. And I have taught a 54-year-old wealthy, wealthy farmer who could buy and sell me several times over. And I taught him how to read when he was 54 years old. And he came to see me and to learn how to read because I had taught his son how to read, two of his sons how to read. People, we could teach every child how to read if we would teach teachers how to teach. But we don't. We teach them book saying, or we teach them whole word, or we teach them read the pictures. Bullshit. Before we need to teach them that the language is a code, we need to teach them to encode and decode the language. 85% of the words in the English language are phonetically correct. If kids know the rules of phonics, they can read practically anything that's written in English. I'm telling you, these kids weren't supposed to learn to read, and they did. What was the question? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. These kids weren't supposed to learn to read. They were, they were all supposed to drop out. None of them dropped out of school. They all finished high school except one, Russell, who was killed in an alcohol-related accident two weeks before graduation. The rest of them, of the 16, of the 15 that are left, at least six and now maybe eight of them have completed two or four or more years of post-high school education. One has been a lawyer for years. So see, I didn't succeed with all of them. He's just a damn lawyer, but I did the best I could. <laughs> one of them has been a junior and senior high school principal for years, and two years ago, he left the, he left being a principal, he left administration and began his own business, put together a business of his own. They refused to live down to teachers' expectations of them after they left my classroom. And when uh, Rex was in college, he came to my classroom to visit one night after school. He said, Mrs. Elliott, we found out that those other teachers lied about us, lied to us. I said, no, 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 no. They didn't lie to us. And I didn't tell you they lied to you. 
They just didn't know what they were doing. He said, that's right, they didn't. If you could teach us to read, they should have been able to. Yes, they should have. The kid who had a language all her own, if you watch the film, she speaks in the film and you have no difficulty understanding her. And the kid who is a stutterer doesn't stutter in the film, nor did he stutter after he left my classroom. Because we say the sounds of the language in isolation for 40 minutes a day, and we read words and we spell words that have those sounds and words that have those sounds in them, and it's absolutely magic, and any teacher who's a failure today should take a course in Orton Gilliam or Orton Slinger and Phonics and teach every child in the classroom how to read. These kids call me often, I see them often, and they say, remember what you told me? Two weeks, three weeks ago, I was walking down the street in those days, and this young woman said, Mrs. Elliot, how are you? I said, I'm fine, who are you? She said, I'm Sheila. Mm -hmm. I said, well, sure you are. No, she doesn't. But sure you are. Oh, yeah, wonderful. She said, and we talked and talked and talked. I listened a lot at that point. And she said, every week I think of something you taught us. She said, you taught us how to live outside the classroom. She said, you taught us life lessons, Mrs. Elliot. And I thought, bully for you. Good for you. But you see, you can't teach if people don't decide to learn. Now, if you decided to learn in here today, you could have learned. If you decide not to learn, then you won't learn. That's not my problem. That's your problem. You deal with it. Did I answer the question? You did. What's the we got two quick ones. There's no, there are quick questions, there are no quick answers. I guess you realize that, don't you? Go ahead. Could you explain again the platinum rule? Oh, the platinum rule. The platinum rule says, do unto others as others, others would have you do unto them. Treat others the way they want to be treated. Do not do unto others as you would have others do unto you. That's, that is me, that's egocentric, don't do it. Do unto others as others would have you do unto them. I know that we don't all want to be treated alike. If I get on an airplane and I ask you to put my luggage up, will you say, sure, I'll be glad to do that for you. Is that all right with you? Is that all right with me if you offer to? Yes, but if you get on an airplane and I say to you, hey, son, you want me to put that up there for you? Are you going to like it? You don't care? How many of you think he wouldn't like it if I said, hey, sonny, let me put that up there for you, obviously you can't do it. How many of you think he'd like that? Well, hell no. We don't treat others the way we want to be treated, people. We need to treat others the way they want to be treated. And in order to find out how they want to be treated, you have to ask them, you have to listen to the answer, and then they, you have to do as they ask. It's called communication. But you won't, you won't communicate with people if you don't even admit, when you've got a tall white man and a tall black woman standing beside you, if you won't even admit that you are willing to say the word color or race first. And you know that's the first one we see. Answer the question? You did. Thank we got you. one more. Last one. So, when it comes to the question of race, how many minds do you think you've changed over? How many minds do I think I've changed over 50 years? I haven't changed one mind. I can't change minds. If people decide to change, they will. Some of you decided to change and move into the middle. Some of you didn't. That's what white people do. They want to change. I don't know that I have changed any minds. I know I've changed my own. I've changed one, I know. My father used to say to us, don't bring any picanities into this house as grandchildren. I showed him the film that was made in my classroom the second year I did the exercise, made by the Navy Broadcasting Corporation. I showed it to, they sent me a copy of it, and I set it up in the, in the hotel with my parents and I. And we watched that film together, my mother and he, and me. And after it was over, this man, this 60-year-old man, stood up in his bib overalls with his blue chambray shirt rail rolled up to the elbow, took his red handkerchief out of his back pocket, and said, as he blew his nose and wiped his eyes, said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. Now people say to me, how dare you do that to those little white children for a day? And I say, how dare you do that to little black children for a lifetime? And when people criticize me, when people criticize me, I say, my father said, and he's the most honest man I've ever known in my life, he would not tell a lie. My mother never told the truth, but my father never told the truth. <laughs> but he said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. Nobody can criticize this exercise and say it doesn't work, because it literally changed the way my father saw his life and his children 
and his wife and his relatives and his friends and people who are different from himself. So I know I changed one, but that was his choice to change. And if you choose to change, you'll change. But black people have no freaking choice. You have to go along with this nonsense. You have to pretend to think white. You have to talk white. You have to walk white. You have to dress white. You have to be, in order to be right, you gotta be white. Give it up, people. You might as well start giving it up now. Here's what women of all kinds and black people have to do. Stop playing defense and start playing offense. You have been on defense long enough. You do not have to apologize for being black. And women, you do not have to apologize for being women. You got it? Stop playing defense and go out there and say, you're not going to do this to my kids. And you do it, you say one racist statement to my kids in this school, and I won't burn the school down, but I'll make you wish you had never been born. Because there are enough of us, if white women and people of color get together, and, and white males who care, we can change this situation if we decide to. But if you decide to just let it wash over you, it'll get better eventually. Or if you decide that, well, Cain and Abel, you know, and God made one of them black and the other one white. So yeah. we have the mark of Cain, right? How many of you have heard that nonsense? That is nonsense, people. Stop believing it. The first modern human beings that evolved on this earth were black women. What a person in this room who looks like the first modern human being to evolve on this earth, please stand. What are you waiting for? <laughs> you don't have to stand if you're tired. Now, nah, people, you're not a woman. Sit down. <laughs> Sound. Besides, you've got a suit on. You don't have your red sweater. People, this is what the first modern human beings look like. They look like you. They didn't look like me. You need to know that, and you need to be proud of that, and you need to be assured of that, and you need to pass it on. And you need to pass the lesson on. The first people that evolved on this earth were black, and that's Native Americans. Blacks came to this continent, and now we call them Indians, but they weren't Indians. They were Native. They were blacks. And in their DNA, there's a memory of those countries in Africa. Thank you very much. Did you learn anything in here today? When you leave here, act black. Don't act white. Act black. You'll be better, better off for doing so. Thank you very much. Have I answered all the questions now? We have. Can we again give my cousin and your cousin Jane? Thank you all so much. Uh, we're going to ask for you to hold tight just for a minute. We'd like for um, the man that's responsible for at least allowing me the opportunity to keep pushing the envelope. You guys know with our uh, Black History Day programs, what we do for Martin Luther King Day, and even the exposure that we're able to have with the Human Relations Commission, that this is going beyond. You know, we had like Dick Gregory here, you know, we had a Black Panther here a couple years ago, we had Dr. Margaret Burroughs here, we had uh, the Pullman Porters, we had people like um, the Tuskegee Airmen, and so Township Supervisor Franklin Zuccarelli has really given me the latitude to continue to push the envelope to bring people, uh, influential folks like Jane Elliott, uh, to the township for us to hear from them front and center, get it straight from their mouths. And so, again, I thank you all for all the support that we've gotten over the uh, last 15 plus years. But the reason that we've been able to do that is because Supervisor Zuccarelli has really put faith and trust in us and in our vision uh, to keep moving the township forward, to be progressive. So I want to bring him up here for him to have a few words uh, to close us out for the day. And again, I thank you again. Uh, so without further ado, please put your hands together for Township Supervisor Franklin Zuccarelli. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry we uh, we anticipated we'd have an overflow crowd. Uh, I 
you know that we had a larger crowd at the beginning of the event, but uh, there were a lot of people that should have been here that weren't. And uh, uh, Dr. Elliott, we're going to have to have him back. Uh, in our community, but we have a lot, lot of growing to do. We have a lot more to learn about each other. Uh, we have uh, so much in common that it, 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 it boggles our minds, and yet people think we're so different. Uh, we're not different. We're not different at all. Uh, and for those of you that, that know me, I've been out here now, and I'm just uh, uh, I'm finishing up my 40th year on the college board. And I always thought 60 was old, but I guess it's not that old. In my lifetime, as I look back at it, I have more people of color that are my friends than people that look just like me. And, uh, and that's because of my experiences. Uh, when I walk into a room, if I see people, I enjoy the, that they're there. I'm just happy that someone came to talk to me. <laughs> so I don't care what color they are. Most of the time, I don't even know what color they are. I don't pay attention to that. In Thornton Township, we love all, all the people that live here. We love everybody. And I know we have to uh, learn how to uh, what was it? Uh, we, we have to make sure that we are just first, justice before love. So we'll, we 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 believe that we're that we're just, that we believe in justice. But we're going to have to make sure that we emphasize that more. Uh, many times, we'll, somebody will come in and there's nothing that we can do for them, and we apologize and give them a hug, say good luck. Uh, that doesn't work very well. We have to figure out a way to make this work better. And we're working on that. We can't do that without each and every one of you and so many others that didn't make it here today. We have to do that. We have to get them involved. We have to make them understand that a community that works together, that lives together, and that enjoys life together is the kind of community we are and the kind of community we're going to be in the future. But we can't do that without your help. Uh, Dr. Elliott, I, uh, it took us probably a couple months to decide whether or not we were going to invite you. <laughs> Does that usually take that long? We looked at a little video and uh, I thought it was okay and then we talked to some of our human relations commissions and they said, boy, did you hear what she said? I said, yeah, I, you heard what she said. I said, you know, I, I think it was probably pretty, pretty much on. And we may not want to think that's the way my mother thought or my father thought or our neighbors thought, but it probably was. It probably was. So we finally decided in Third Township we're open-minded. We want to, we have uh, people of all different backgrounds. And uh, honestly, uh, I, can, I can pretty much say when I see somebody, I can think, well, there's a black man coming in here to talk to me, or a black woman. Uh, there's a lady coming to talk to me, or there's a man coming to talk to me. I don't pay attention to that. And it's something that, uh, it happened to me as soon as I got out of my environment here when I was going to school. When I went in the military, and traveled around the country and met people from all different parts of our nation. And I realized that I had more young African American people that I was friends with than young white people, Caucasian people. I, 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 don't, I don't understand how that happened, except that I was exposed to people from all different parts of our country. And I heard the way people talked to them. And I see the way that they were treated. And that just didn't, didn't make me feel good. Didn't make me feel right. And I was able to do a lot of things to change the environment down there, but 
the environment down south and some of the places that I've been uh, were pretty disappointing. To me. I couldn't believe that people would actually treat each other like that. But then I realized that some of those some of those people in charge down there they didn't think that everybody was people. They thought you were something else. I, I, I just I just don't understand it. I just can't understand. It. Uh, we worked real hard out here in Tort Township to try to bring everybody together. That's the most important thing. Once we're together, once we're working together, when we start to eat together, and we start to live together, we can learn how to respect each other better. But we have to do that. You can't just do that by waving to somebody as we walk past and say, oh yeah, she's a nice lady, but no, I've never sat down and talked to her. We have to start talking to each other. We have to start getting to know each other better. And uh, we have a long way to go. Our country has a long way to go. And, you know, after Barack Obama got, got elected, I said, okay, we're moving in the right direction. Things are better. Because I knew Barack personally, he was a great man. We were involved with him when he was a state senator, we were involved with him when he was a U.S. senator, and we got involved with him again when he ran for president of the United States. And we thought, boy, we're moving in the right direction. Things are getting better. And then look what the hell happened to us. <laughs> I remember the hemorrhoid more than anything else. <laughs> you can believe that? So we have a lot to do. And one of the things we have to do is on November 6th, make sure we go out there and vote. Yeah. And then in two years, we have to do it again. We need a better governor, and we, de we definitely need a better president. Yeah. This guy is an embarrassment. I don't understand how I don't understand how many people here voted for Trump. But you're not gonna say that you did anything. <laughs> but I still know people that say, Oh yeah, I agree with him. He's a good man. So what could be possibly good about him? Right. I'm with you. We have a lot we have a lot a lot of progress that we've made and we have a whole lot more that we've got to make. I'm so happy that, that those of you that were here today had the opportunity to, to listen to Dr. Elliott and maybe pick up some things and learn a little bit more than uh, we thought we knew. Because we all thought we knew everything. And yet we're always learning something. Uh, tell some of the young people that work with us, they say, well, I know you think, you know, you're, you're, you're older, you're smarter. Said, no, 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 I'm not older and I'm not, I am older, but I'm not smarter. I learned from... 16 and 17 and 19 and 25 year olds all the time. We all learn from each other. And as long as we keep learning from each other and keep caring about each other and making sure that everybody is treated fairly, that we operate our daily lives justly. That's, that's a, a, a tremendous, tremendous observation and something that we all have to make sure that we pay attention. Thank you so much for coming. I've got some people that I want to introduce. I don't know how many of them are still here, but I'm going to tell you their names real quick. Some elected officials that were here with us today. Uh, from uh, the city of Harvey, the third ward alderman and a candidate for mayor of the city of Harvey, uh, Mr. Chris Clark. He was sitting right there. Where'd he go? Anybody? 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 Uh, Anthony McCaskill. Is Anthony still here? No, oh, he's, he's uh, I guess they're out there campaigning. They're both running for mayor of Harvey. Uh, Robert Fitzgerald from the uh, village of Dixmore, trustee. Robert Fitzgerald. Sandra Slayton, from, uh, a trustee from the village of Hazelcrest. Eugene Dumas, the, a board member from the Rotary of Homewood. Larry Lawrence uh, from School District 148, the Vice President. Hey, Larry, how are you? Patrice Burt, Vice President of School District 151, and she said she's not running for anything. <laughs> Where's Patrice? Did she, she had a vote? Felicia Johnson from the Harvey Public School. District 132, and a candidate for Walt Alderman in the sixth ward. Hi, Nina Graham, I know that she had to leave and go pick up her granddaughter, and she says she's coming right back, so maybe we'll see her out there in the atrium. Uh, Nina Graham, the president of School District 205. 
Nina? Uh, Annette Whittington from School District 205. Did she leave? Oh, she's in the hall. Trustee Louise Copeland, the Dalton Library Trustee. <laughs> Elizabeth Gonzalez, Dalton Library Trustee. She's in the hallway too? Okay. Uh, Human Relations Commissioner Oscar Canales from the Village of South Island. Is Oscar here? He's there probably. There he is. Oscar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paula Counts from the Thorpe Township Human Relations Commission. And uh, she lives in Calumet City. She's out in the hallway, too. <laughs> well, you can come out in the hallway and meet all of us. <laughs> Ruby Donahue from our Human, Human Relations Commission. Ruby, stand up for this. This is Ms. Ruby Donahue. She's been our Human Relations Commissioner since the beginning. Her and Joyce Washington are the two that have been there on our Human Relations Commission the longest. Uh, from the village of Dixmoor, HRC Commissioner Tui Muse. Tui? Thank you so much. From the Human Relations Commission representing the city of Calumet City, Ms. Mabel Ricker. From our Human Relations Commission uh, representative village of Lansing, Mr. Bert Rivera. I know Bert's here because I was talking to him about it. Okay. Joyce Washington from the village of Dalton, a 20 year trustee with us here at Thornton Township and the chairman of our Human Relations Commission. And I have Annette Whittington in here again. How about Joe Whittington from the Second Ward of the City of Harvard. All the members of the I understand we have some uh, refreshments out. Are they going to be right out there? Or we can... Oh, in the cafeteria. So please join us. We can talk a little bit, be a little bit. We learned how to be really honest and open, so we should talk like that when we go outside. And no fighting. <laughs> Let's get to know each other better. God bless you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Elliott. Thank you so much for coming today. Let's not forget what we've learned here today. Let's be nicer to each other.